the Discord link in here, and I'll I'll uh, pin it. <clears throat> so who's going to be first? Oh, interesting. What the heck? That's weird. Hey, Sam. Good morning. How do I? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I can actually, I guess, like. Huh. It's weird. I didn't know I could do that. So now you got this little tab here. That's new. Woo! <laughs> Party! Woohoo! It's Paul David's Day. Party! <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So, yeah, and the way I set up my screen is I have the OBS window, which for some reason now I can't get it to compress a little bit. It's like it got the information down here got bigger and I, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and then uh, I've got uh, Google Chrome uh, here with the chat on my right. I There is a way I can import the chat. Um, let me see. I'm Window capture, video capture device. Yeah, that's what I've already got. Okay. Siphon client. I need to experiment with some of these things, but I don't know what that any of these things mean. So I'm not an expert. Well, we'll see if we get any Paul David subscribers showing up. Um, I, I actually, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the analytics right now and um, in my subscriber count jumped up about 300 in the last, I mean, I think I had 119,500 and something, I think. But I could be wrong. Let me, let me, it doesn't give me, on analytics, it doesn't give me subscriber like 20, you know, last 24 hours kind of thing. So, but um, the, uh, yeah, but I can see my view counts up. Normally my view counts in the 100 range and now it's in the 700 range. So maybe people will join in. Uh, love my guitar intelligence. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's just years of playing. Oh, shoot. There was someone who asked specifically what guitar this is. This is, it's an Affinity series, Square Strat, and this one was made in China, crafted in China. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, the, hey, my, uh, Mitchell, I think that's how you would say your name. Um, the uh let's see if i can find that comment again so i can say specifically or maybe i'll you know and sometimes i mean having dexterity guitar skills guitar chops whatever um kind of aids th this method of writing or composing or coming up with stuff. And that's just noodling, which everybody kind of, from the get-go, I think everybody tends to noodle. But it's one way, one thing to noodle and just kind of go boop. But it's another thing to noodle maybe with some, I don't want to necessarily say intelligently because my goal when I'm noodling is not to think too much, so that would bring intelligence out of it. But m your finger intelligence might come into play. So you might. You know, you just kind of keep messing around and all of a sudden you find, might find something. Um, or if you discover a new chord. I, I did a, uh, a, a video, if you've never seen it, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, let's see, search across my channel. Combinatorics, let's see. If I've done it twice, creating a part combinatory. I mean, this goes back to 2011. It's hilarious. I, for all the Paul Davis listeners, you, you're, you're, if you're gonna go through my catalog of, of videos, you're, <laughs> you're gonna see a lot of changing hairstyles, a lot of camera, different camera looks. I mean, oh my gosh, you know, the cheap, I, I, I wish I had Paul Davis. One of the reasons why I totally said yes to Paul Davis is because I wanted to see his process. He was coming here to see my process, but I was watching his too. And 
For one thing, he had an assistant, um, and I can't remember his name. Anybody know his assistant? Um, uh, but he um, he was doing, you know, he was doing the handheld camera stuff, and then they mounted another camera. Um, and like I said, we were hanging out for two hours, so they had four hours to go through. So it took, and that was back at Nam. I think was that April or March, and so it took it took uh, Paul quite a while to go through it. You know, I'm sure there were a couple times. We thought, yeah, I may not make this video because it was probably going to be so much work. But, um, but yeah, this video is hilarious. You can, you can, if you click on it, I don't know if it'll change your window, uh, but you, if you, uh, you click on, it, you can bookmark it. Um, but combinatorics. So what, what is combinatorics? I, and, and I've talked about this probably on my live stream, and it, I literally came up with it on the freaking fly. I didn't know it was called combinatorics. But I came up with it on the fly when someone in a clinic, I was teaching a clinic at a church in like, not like Palmdale, Lancaster, somewhere in the desert. And somebody said, hey, how can I learn more chords? And I, <laughs> it just came out of my head. I said, you already, you know more chords than you think you know. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And I go, well, let's look at this G bar chord, right? So G major bar chord, third fret. Uh, G is bar three, five, five, four, three, three. And don't worry if you can't play a bar chord because that's kind of the point of this observation. But a chord technically is two or more notes. Um, and the most we can have at this point is six. So there's one chord right there. Um, but if we just take the bottom two, that's a power chord. Okay. Uh, if we take the... That's actually how Smoke in the Water is played, but that's the next two notes. And then take the next notes, we got triplets. And, you know, I might... That, um, that's just the, the middle two strings, okay? And then I go to the next. You know, it can inspire ideas. Just with those notes in the top two. I always think of Chuck Berry. He made those top two strings of a bar chord sing. Okay, so there's, so one for the whole thing. Two, three, four, five, six so far. Well, if you do all the possible combinations where we go, then every other string, and then every skip two strings, and then we skip three strings, and then we do the bottom three, the next three, the next three, the next three, then we put, like do three, uh, let's see, do that where we uh, play the bottom four, but then skip the third string, so we end up with five, uh, sorry, uh, three, five, nothing, and then four. That's a great voicing. Uh, and then the next one, and then here. So if you do all of the possible combinations, you end up with 56 different chords. And then you can apply that to all the major chords in the key of G, the, the G and the C, and you can do the minor chords, you can do the same thing. And you can do the one, uh, the two, three, and six. And so now you've got all these, like if I just take the, the, sixth string and the third string it's very piano sounding and that's a very common um, a common voicing to use now but it wasn't that long ago nobody would think about that um when i did home to mama which is a bieber song oops what did i do D. And it's funny because if I'd gone, I so I'm playing what I call tenths to a ninth. Tenth. Okay, and the reason it's called a tenth is you count up in the key of D. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You get the tenth, and then the ninth is there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
So I'm going 10th, 9th, and then another 10th. And then the same thing with the A chord. And then <laughs> instead of going to G, like a 10th there, I went to the 9th. So it created this kind of like, wait, what? It doesn't, but in some ways that A note's in the D chord, so it sounded almost more like, almost like a kind of resolved to a D chord in some ways. Now this one they did loop. Uh, the funny thing is they looped like a seven bar phrase. So if you listen to it, the sometimes the chorus is like, you know, like that, where I'm slapping and playing fuller chords. And other times it's real simple because it was an odd seven bar repeat. So, hey, Thomas. Um, oh, yeah, my volume is too high. Sorry. Yeah, I got to. And I'm not going through. I don't know how. I'm such a, a noob when it comes to this OBS software. I don't know how to get my uh, guitar to show up instead of through the microphone on the, uh, but thanks for pointing that out. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, let me see, how can I, mic auxiliary, properties, Yeah, it says baby face. So I wonder, let me see. I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to see if there's anything I can push up here that sends signal to that. Yeah, I got I got some faders here on my baby face interface. Um, baby face interface but none of them are changing this mic auxiliary thing. Uh, advanced audio settings, okay. Activity, audio monitoring. Okay, hold on, let me turn down my volume for a second just in case this goes. Ah, see, yeah, that, we don't wanna do that, whatever that was. Oh, that's the audio input, okay, this one, See. Yeah, I'm not. I need to get someone out here with that knows how to run this. Uh, so I'm gonna turn this back off. Um, in fact, I'm gonna put that down. Okay, that knows how to do this OBS connect. I should just experiment with it um, and see if I can finally get that the my logic to to play through so you can hear a bunch, much better sound. Now, you'll still hear it coming through the monitors, but what I could do is turn off the monitors, but then I won't be able to hear what I'm doing. So I'll try to keep an eye on the meter here, and that will keep it from peaking a little bit, but it might be a little quiet. You might have to turn up the computer on your end, but there'll be less distortion. Um, so now we got about the normal number of people here. We do have some new people, though. Love seeing it. Um, so yeah, so that, that, I mean, like, that's one of the most important things I can tell you is that like, you know more than you think you know. When you know one thing, it's like you actually can extrapolate that into dozens of things. Uh, in this case, 56 different chords. Um, and like, even like that voicing, like I said, and some of these, of these 56 voicings would be like, I, I'm never going to use that. But then you have one that's like, oh, wait, okay, that's kind of cool. I mean, like, even like playing in this on this bar chord, the G bar chord, if you just play the fifth and third string, you get a sixth. There's no root in there. But that's... Lately, I've been playing, like, a lot of times I'll play the, the triad there. I really like the sound. Love the sound of that. And there's a real cool advantage to, to playing those notes. In other words, I'm just taking the bar off and I'm just playing those three strings. And oftentimes I'll use my fingers, I may have a pick in my hand, but I'll use my fingers just to kind of get it a little bit more human sounding. This is called hybrid picking when you use a pick and fingers. But the beauty of this is you got your second right here. You don't need the root in there. 
you're playing with a bass player. And it's not that you wouldn't think of playing that that voicing, but usually you might play it up here. Like that, but lately I've been gravitating towards lower voicings on guitars. I really like, now this is not one that derives from this bar chord, but I do love this. Instead of playing a power chord like this, oftentimes I'll play the root and third instead of the root and fifth. To me that sounds really kind of poppy, but then I might add an octave with that. another little trick I'm get, I always like to give away my, my channel was originally called pro guitar secrets because I was wanting to kind of and, and again my premise for starting my channel was um, and starting teaching was that I had stopped teaching private lessons after 35 years I taught from the age of 15 uh, I taught my first guitar lesson I think I was 15 years old and I stopped teaching at 50 and uh, so I had like 35 years of pedagogy just pure just teaching private lessons and around that same time, my dad passed away and everything he knew about jazz and, uh, I mean, he's seen so many jazz people and uh, he, he knew everything about baseball. He was even uh, drafted out of high school in 1949 by the Cardinals. Not drafted, he was scouted and they wanted him to play on a farm club. Um, he didn't, but um, so the... Um, uh, the, but when he passed away, all that information went away. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to start teaching my lessons so when I die, you all can have it forever and ever and ever if you want it, you know. Uh, I know it's pretty morbid, but that's just how my brain thinks. So uh, I know we're temporal beings. So um, I try to, I, I want to share as much. So that's kind of why I give the secret to that. Now, so with this, the, the thing I was going to say was that when you're playing in a key like G, C, A, even E or E minor, you know, you're playing in the good, friendly guitar keys, keys that tend to, that most of these strings would be, you know, the E, A, D, G, B, E would be in the key. You can be a little bit messy. If you're playing an A flat, you can't really hit those open strings because none of those chords... None of those chords sound very good, you know? Yeah. My finger wants to snap, okay. Uh, but if you're in G, it, you know, you can, act, you can have more open strings accidentally ringing out. In other words, you don't necessarily have to be using everything. Because again, that's kind of one of those things where you know, and I want to do a video. I've got a lot of things to talk about with AI, um, but it's kind of one of those things that AI can't really do. Like a, a guitar sampler, I hear they have some squeaks, and and a keyboard player can hit like down way down here on the keyboard or way up here on the keyboard and insert a squeak, or insert a buzz, or you know, there's all these you know sampled sounds. But like having unintended strings ring out. That would take so much time to program into that. It's just easier to pick up a guitar and do it yourself. I mean, to be honest, most of the composers I work for, I mean, uh, Jason Graves, uh, Steve Jablonski, um, Austin doesn't play guitar at all, but, but a lot of them play guitar, so they don't call me to play basic guitar stuff because they can do that. Um, it's easier for them to do it than for them to direct me to do it. So, um, but it's... It's definitely, you know, you can, you don't have to be like an amazing guitar player to have something that's completely useful. Okay, sorry. The treble strings sound good. It's the bass that's fuzzy. Uh, yeah, let me see. What I can, I can uh, put an EQ on the master fader and cut the, cut the bass. You know, I can do that. Now my, my speakers are mounted on separate stands. They're not on the same table as the microphone here. So that it wouldn't be transferring there, but okay. I rolled off the bass on the on the master fader, so we'll see what happens. 
<laughs> Sorry. I, you know, I got to work out. I got to figure out a way to kind of work on that. But my room is also a little bit on the boomy side. Um, when I'm uh, tracking, a lot of times certain strings will like jump out. That's why I'll go to headphones if I have problems. It's it's the fact that my room's square. Um, all rooms have a tendency that what's the every 18 inches. Somebody, uh, a, a friend of mine who designs rooms and did all of the rooms, so many of the rooms in LA, but all the rooms at Universal. Um, you know the 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 um, uh, the support. You know the t two two by fours. You know uh, what's it called? The, the studs are at like 18 inches, and that 18 inches creates basically this. It like resonates this B frequency or the B you know the B or C, and that's and that's what happens in this room. It's like it, it gets out of control. And I'm also sitting. But see, the reason that it doesn't really bother me that much is not even that important. Is because I'm not mixing. If I were mixing, it would be a problem because then I would be like EQing that out and then people would be listening to the music and they'd go, well, where's the B note? It's gone. You know, no, I don't do that. Um, if I have some woofiness, I turn down or I uh, go to headphones if the woofiness is bothering me. Um, and sometimes, you know, when I'm soloing, if I hit a low note, it's, you know, the whole room. If I'm Because like when I solo a lot of times in the studio, I like to be playing loud for inspiration and for sustain. But um, I want to make sure if, if there's anybody new here, I want to do a shout out. I mean, I should shout out everybody. And do, am I, is it just me or do we all have that? Now we have a little heart button in the, in the chat box. You could do a worried face. Was that whatever that is? Party, smile, heart. Oh yeah. You guys have it too. Okay. <laughs> hey, Javier, what's going on? Do guitars on the wall give you much? No. Not really. Um, when I'm recording acoustics, I would really have to be strumming really loud. Um, and my main microphone for acoustics is this Gefell. Um, uh, sometimes I'll record stereo and use the 451. You know, I, I, I would upgrade my mics and get like a, a like a U87 or a TL170 or a, I, I really like the red microphone. I mean, I like the concept of it. I don't I've never had one in the studio. Um, I don't get any complaints from my composers. They don't say, hey, man, you need to get new mics or anything like that. So I keep my signal path pretty simple. Um, but yes, these guitars, some of them will ring if I'm playing loud electric stuff, especially if I do like a, of course, there's reverb and delay on this. But if I hit a chord really loud and short, then, you know, I'll hear those ringing, but they, they don't really bother me. They're, they're ringing sympathetically. As far as the mic picking them up, I've never noticed that. Um, there's a dog behind us that will be barking a lot, and I'm always thinking it, composers are going to complain when they get a file and they can hear a dog barking out. But when I listen back to the tracks, and it's really, really hard to do. You have to turn off the mic. You have to really cup your ears because you can't tell sometimes if it's the dog barking over there or if it's a dog barking on the track. Uh, but I rarely can hear the dog bark. So the, even though the microphone is a condenser mic and is fairly sensitive, um, it really doesn't pick up everything. Um, so, but uh, it's certainly my, this is a lot quieter. We've been in this house for over four years now. Uh, prior to that, I lived in an apartment building for 32 years. And I had people above me and outside kids playing out. You know, I was like, yeah, it was, it was a drag sometimes to have to redo something because... The person upstairs dropped what sounded like a bowling ball. <laughs> if you've ever had an upstairs neighbor, you know of which I speak, uh, that uh, it's like, why are they bowling up there? Um, but yeah, so this is an Affinity Stra uh, uh, Squire uh, made in China. So it's literally, I think, the cheapest one. And boy, the back of the neck is, I just noticed the back of the neck is really grimy. I'm not even going to show it to you. I'm so embarrassed. I had a lot of people comment on how dirty the the fretboard was and I'm like yeah I don't it's cuz I ha I've only changed strings on this guitar once <laughs> in the 10 years I've owned it <laughs> the first set last like 6 years or something like that and I I it had such a great sound and vibe I hated to change the strings I was afraid the mojo was was in the strings so and I've used this on other tracks too um yeah Javier, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, to be honest, it's purely convenience. I could, 
people often say, well, you, sh you should keep cases in the guitars in the cases. And I'm kind of like, well, for one thing, I do tend to gravitate towards fairly cheap instruments. I mean, <clears throat> but not with acoustics. I don't really, I have a couple cheap acoustics, but for the most part, my acoustics are pretty nice. Uh, that's a little tougher to have a cheap one. Not, not plain wise, but sonically, you know, cheap acoustics sound like toys. Um, and that's sometimes the sound I'm going for, to be honest. I've got one of those Gretsch, uh, uh, I did a video on it, Gretsch, oh, hey, Paul, or Polly. <laughs> oh, these, well, I don't know what were in the original, I don't know what strings were on the original guitar uh, that I got, because I didn't put them on. Uh, these are Elixir 9. So I generally use Elixirs on all, all of my electrics, except, um... Let's see. Is there are there any electric? Well, one thing I've I've got I've got so I got a new mandolin. You saw that I don't know if you saw the mandolin video, but that's my new mandolin. It's not a great mandolin, but it's a new mandolin. Um, but I'm thinking about taking my old mandolin and putting Martin strings on it instead of elixirs. But the reason is, and they'll go bad fast, but that's okay. Uh, but the reason is because I want to play it with a bow. I've been doing a lot of bowing, and even this bow that. Um, uh, the company, this company sent me from, uh, from Israel, um, which is for guitars. It only works on like acoustic, it only works on the top two strings. If, if you're using elixirs, because the wound, everybody, uh, we have a drinking game. And one of the rules is if I change guitars, everybody has to take a sip. So make sure you have some kind of libation handy. But if I, um, Picasso. This is called a Picasso. I think is what it's called. But see, if I do it on the B string, I think I need more rosin. You know, I can get two strings. Um, but on the, it won't do anything on the elixir, on the, on the, uh, coded strings because it's basically kind of vinyl on vinyl is it's not going to create any friction. You can put all the rosin you have on your bow and it's not going to do anything. So I don't have any acoustics that I can really, I can only do that with the top strings because all of my acoustics are elixirs. So, you know, maybe if I got into doing this or bowing, I am bow like, uh, I bowed the, the tie pin. That sounded really cool. I just got a new uh, dulcimer. Which is way out of tune. I don't even know what I want to tune to. Um... C, I think. Uh, and these are the strings that came with it. So, oh wait, no, these are new strings. Uh, but these are Martin. I put these on. These are Martin strings. So they are not wound. And it's... Now, to get all four strings, I have to push down pretty hard on the bow to get all the strings, but it's a great sound. <laughs> but a lot of times I'll just tune it to it, whatever I want. It creates the sound I want to get. And, you know, you can find dulcimer super cheap. I think I paid 30 bucks for this one. Uh, pe people are always buying. And the only downside is that the frets is a diatonic scale. That's intentional. So it makes it really easy to play songs on without having to know anything about music. Um, but the downside is I can't play, like, minor. I can do minor if I 
think, okay, this is C, so technically C major, so technically this could be A minor. So if I played over A minor, this would sound like A minor. I'm, and I could change a couple string tuning or something like that. But uh, yeah, so, um, but this does not, I didn't put elixirs on this because my sole intention on this one was to bow it. I, might, I mean, I could use it occasionally as a... Uh, move the the string spacing the string spacing isn't right but it's a fun instrument to play actually and I like the sound of them they look cool hanging on the wall I don't know if it's going to go here I may put this in the my wife is always saying that I can hang more stuff in the living room, and I really don't want to. Um, because, you know, because like when I'm in the living room or the den or whatever, I kind of want to not think about work. And I know that sounds crazy, but literally this is a job, and I love it. I love my job. But playing guitar, I dropped a pick earlier. Oh, so take another sip. That's another one of the drinking game rules. Did anybody see me drop that pick? I don't think you saw me do that. I don't know where it is. I have the lights off. It's actually, in spite of how it looks, it's actually really dark in here. It's that this camera is really sensitive. So, Claudio, nice to meet you. Oh, what is that called? That's called, you could call that, believe it or not, it's kind of, uh, oh, hey, we got a lot of people here. That's awesome. Uh, it's, it's a dulcimer. Um... Uh, it's an, a mountain dulcimer sometimes called, or, uh, or an Appalachian, Appalachian dulcimer. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of, it was a, a poor person's instrument. It was, you know, generally fairly cheap to make and often crafted people would make their own. I mean, I... I see them all the time where they're just homemade at like go to Goodwill or uh, particularly in the Midwest, if you're at like a, a thrift store or something like that, you'll find things like that. And they'll be like, sometimes it's just handmade. It's like somebody made it themselves in their wood shop. I've got a guy uh, in Nashville, Indiana. Um, yet yeah, there is a Nashville, Indiana, not Tennessee, but Nashville, Indiana, totally different town. Uh, mountain, mountain made music. Okay, I'm gonna give you a link. He, now these are not these are more expensive because you know these are currently new made. The great thing is he makes these wood cases for him too. So I mean, if you get one, pay a little extra and get the wood case. They're really cool. So you can check those out. I have uh, he's made me two things so far. Um, I've got my bowed psaltery, which is like a multi-string instrument with bows um, that you bow. <laughs> How's that for? insight uh and then um uh, he also uh let's see find a pick here oh what if i drop this see how many picks are in here if i drop this how many sips would that be um <clears throat> so let's see also um if you're your uh yeah thank you yeah we got a lot of people here we got a lot of um uh i okay sam okay i i do play hammered well no i have a hammered dulcimer i've used it i actually used it i think on an apex track because it was like there was a some some music that um some MIDI and something that, that Stephen Barton sent me, and I went, oh, you know, that would kind of sound cool on the Hammer Dulcimer. So I go to the, I go to my uh, my other room that I have amps in and stuff like that. I go there and I get, I grab the Hammer Dulcimer and I bring it in here, and I'm literally spending the next hour and a half tuning the dang thing, you know. And uh, I got it a pretty good deal too, and um, so I'm I finally got it in tune, and I'm kind of kind of working it and like it's. 
it's organized in a certain way and you once you kind of get get it you can figure out the triads and everything so i i kind of got it i think i got it good enough for the for the for the passage it was i was doing what what's called an ostinato kind of a repeating figure so it was probably something like and i'm not really much of a drummer or i'm not anything of a drummer <laughs> I don't want to say I, I don't want to imply I play drums at all. Alex is my son is a good drummer, but but yeah. So I'm like hammering these things and going okay, trying to get a good time and everything. And so yeah, but I would not say I play a hammer dulcimer. I have one, and um, one of the um, tools that I have given I have for composers is I created this Google spreadsheet where I have a list of instruments, and I didn't realize it was as many instruments as it was. But it's I think I'm over 80 different in, different instruments. I'm not, I'm not talking like you know, 80 guitars. No, it's 80 different instruments. Um, but some of them are duplicates. Like, for example, one one instrument would be the mountain dulcimer and another one would be the bowed dulcimer. So there's difference. A difference in sound, different in usage, difference in, in context in a film score or whatever. Um, George Darren, who's the top guy in town for film scores, he does a lot of bowing on dulcimers. And that's where I got the idea from. So uh, I just, I, I stole it from him. Um, Evan, let's see, hear more about all, oh, the all Eastern guitar. Yeah. Yeah. That was just, I, I just, you know, I, I occasionally have moments of freaking inspiration and I just thought, Hey, what would it sound like if I had an all Eastern guitar? And I originally called it the cluster guitar. So I'll, I'll get it out. So everybody get, make sure you have something to take a sip with here. Everybody take a sip. This is Paul, Paul, this day, July 17th, will forever be Paul David's day for me. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure this is all E right now. But originally, I bought this. I, I wanted to be able to do clusters. And you're like, well, what's a cluster? Well, cluster, a cluster is if you... If you sit on a piano, you create a cluster. Like anybody can play a cluster. You, you know, a cat can play a cluster. You just put your hand on the piano and hit all the white or white keys and black keys at the same time, and it's like that. You know, it's just this this blast of chromatic tones. Okay, so I'm going to pull up a sound. I'm going to, add, I'm going to insert a new sound, a different patch, and this patch is going to have um, delays and reverb. It's going to be a patch that I normally use, let's say, for um, swells for fading in things. So it doesn't, you don't ever hear, the beauty of swell patches is that you don't hear, um, you, do, you don't hear the pick. So I got my volume pedal down and I'm just gonna go, oh wait, here we go. See, that is a sound you couldn't really play on a normal guitar. And I can even, you know, all right. Okay, so these are all E's, I think. Basically E's, except I tuned the bottom one to E flat. So now I have E flat, E, F, F sharp, G, and G sharp or A flat. So if I wanted all that, I could. Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll capo too. So, you know, maybe if I don't want e, a bunch of E's, I could. And then if I go to that swell sound, maybe roll off the tone. Ooh. Dirty pot. Oh, dirty. That's a dirty uh, switch. Kind of a cool sound, actually. <laughs> I'm going to call it the dirty switch guitar. I always loved it when Hendrix and, and 
Steve Ray Vaughn would flip in the middle of a solo would change pickup selections. You know, it's just, it's like, oh man, that's so cool. Like he, he actually wanted to change the sound of his voice in the middle of a solo. It makes complete sense. And see, there's, there's where the tone off. But if I swell it, you don't hear the pick. So, but, so that was my use for it. That was what I, that's what I originally, um, you know, bought it for. I figured, you know, I think it was, I paid, I think I paid 80 bucks for this one. And it's the same, it basically the same one. It's in a, well, this one's a made in China Squire Strat Fender. It doesn't say affinity on it, I don't think. I call it Percy. I don't know why I called it Percy, but I wrote Percy on there. Um, 50th anniversary. I don't know. I, it, it It's all original. I mean, not the strings, obviously. I, I've not done a thing to it. In fact, the action's a little on the high side right now, uh, probably because the neck is starting to pay the price for not having the right tension on it, uh, which somebody said, well, what? You know, that's going to ruin your neck. I'm like, yeah, but it's an $80 guitar. Just buy another one. Um, but then I realized, oh, this is kind of cool. I could do tetrachords. Well, what's a tetrachord? A tetrachord is major scales are basically, I need to get my piano up. Major scales are basically two tetrachords, all right? Meaning two four note scale chunks. Okay, software instrument, let's pull up a piano. I'll just go with a simple Bosendorfer here. Right? Do, re, mi, fa, and then. So it's this, that's a tetrachord, and that's a tetrachord. The first one is, the second one is, and that's a major scale. Well, what's cool is you take that second tetrachord of the C major scale, and it's the first tetrachord of the G major scale. Oops, sorry. And that's the G major scale. Now, the, the second tetrachord of the G major scale, D, F, D, E, F sharp, G, is the first tetrachord of the D major scale. So it just goes by circle of fifths. So it's kind of a cool way to start to visualize scales. Well, this guitar allowed me to do kind of tetrachords. So I could do like in the key of E. Again, the kind of thing, it almost sounds like a hammer dulcimer. It's the kind of thing, in fact, if I wanted to, and I don't know where, oh, here it is. I want to, I could take a triangle mallet and hit it. And if I really want, I can get four fingers on here. It's a little bit, it's easier as you go up the neck. But I love that sound. It's such a great sound. And Paul and I were jamming on it here when he was here. And I said, just play a, a basic E progression. And I handed him this guitar without telling him anything. He saw his reaction. He goes, he looks at it, he goes, wait, is it all E strings? <laughs> He's like, why would you do that? And then I showed him this. And I'm using, just to make it even more special, precious sounding, I'm using uh, the pick that the Edge uses with U2, which is um, one of these, um, it's the uh, blue pick. Oh, from Javier, let's see. Yeah, that's, yeah, what you're hearing is the Valhalla reverb. Yeah, that's, yeah, for $50, you can't beat it. The plate is great. A lot of major session, you know, uh, Bieber and all those, you know, they use the, the vintage reverb. And then they have a couple free ones, too, that are really pretty cool. You should get those. Yeah, isn't that cool, Polly? I, I, it's just like, I, and that's kind of, so here's the thing. I mean, there's probably a thousand guitar players in Los Angeles that are better than me. And, and if you start thinking about it, you know, in any town, you're like, get depressed. You're like, oh, man, there's so many players better than me. And then this this stupid young Latino producer 
I mean, he must have been 24, and I was probably 44, and he, he wasn't stupid. I'm just, I'm saying, calling him stupid because I'm mad at him. He said, I, I said, well, how do you want me to play on this? And I'm, I had him thinking, do you want me to approach it like this guitar player or that guitar player or this guitar player, whatever? And he said, no, I want you to Stralify it. And I went, Stralify it? He goes, yeah, do, make, do what you do. I like what you play. And I'm like, really? I have a sound? I didn't realize I had a sound. I mean, after playing at that point for 30 years, 35 years, I, I developed a style, a way, an approach. And so this is part of my approach to, you know, when I think of weird ways of tuning or stringing instruments, um, it's, how, it's how I, uh, that's what a lot of times I'm getting hired for. They're not necessarily, and now I can read music and I've got good dexterity and I can solo and I can play all these different instruments and read on them and everything. And that's also valuable, but that's, uh, it's very, it, it's, it, it's interesting that I'm actually generally getting hired for who I am and what I bring to the thing. And that's almost true of all musicians. So, okay. So uh, from Pepper Pepper said, Tom, is that a good beginner electric guitar you're playing? What brand again? Oh, um, yes. Uh, Although, and a lot of people on Paul's, on the video I did with Paul t that came out today, a lot of people have commented that, well, you need to get them set up and, and you know, I can kind of do my own setup, but you, you, can, you can get a $200 Squire for electric and I think Strats are really good versatile, versatile guitars and the nice thing about an electric guitar is you can kind of string it up with nines so it's easy to play or tens. These are all tens, I think. I just got a bag of tens. <laughs> I have lots of tens. So this is one of them. Um, I have another one I'll show you. Um, but yeah, I think a Strat first off, and um, because it's versatile, it's not as heavy as a Les Paul. Les Pauls are heavier and tend to be more expensive. They tend to be better woods. Let's see. This one is a very similar Squire. Um, and I think I did this first. This may have happened before the uh the cluster guitar this the the six e strings this is just three low e strings this is really cool because one thing one of the things i did was i did different ten, uh different ages so like this is a 56 54 and 52 or something like that. now we're probably going to run into booby soundtracky kind of vibes with it sometimes I'll just you know let a let a, a track play and just but I can, I can also do that I can create like rock stuff with it so if I were to do um, uh, like we'll pull up a rock sound like chunker or something like that one I call chunker where's that there's chunker Oh, sorry. Let me tune it. Oh, I'm tuned down to C. This is a C. This is way down. Okay. That's the beauty of it too, is I can, I can tune the strings to whatever I want to tune them to. So if I want to have all Cs, I can have all Cs. Now, uh, Pepper, you know, if you, like, the order of quality of strats, like, by where they're made, probably the be the best of the U.S., probably the L.A., the California, and then there's the Arizona, and then Japan, I would say, if it's if it's a made in Japan, M.I.J. is what they call it, M.I.J., um, M.I.M. is made in Mexico, that's probably next. And then from there, it may be Korea, Indonesia, China. I'm not sure. They may be pretty interchangeable at that point. I'm not really sure. But you can look at the back of the headstock. And this is an, a, a made in, in China. 
So. <laughs> So it's just, it's nice having, I'll turn it up a little bit, but it's nice having a, a lot of uh, unison strings. It's super easy to play. Uh, let's see, I can pull a little treble off. It's a little on the brittle side. It's also really easy to play up and down strokes and just only hit the strings you want to hit, right? You, if you were to do like that with a regular six string guitar with a power chord, you, you would have to mute strings. With this, I don't have to mute anything. I have, I have guitars that just have two strings on them, so I can do like, like really fast, um, unmuted thirds, little, tr little dyads, but I can move two strings. I'm only playing down two strings, pushing down two strings. I do one. It's a, you know it, it, it's hard to hear on the with the gain. I can do it with the clean sound, so you can kind of hear. Um, see, I'm not pushing down the bottom string, so I get this. I kind of call this the drone guitar. So I. cool about this and I've used this is that it's super duper easy to bend that bottom string when I mean, you normally can't bottom bend the low E string but I got nothing in the way so it kind of works out um, so let's see. Oh, we still got people in. Check it out. It's crazy. We got a lot of viewers. Welcome. Welcome, Paul David, Mr. Prescribers. That was such a fun video. Paul is such a nice guy. We had a great time. I was super duper honored that he asked to do that. I mean, it meant the world to me. Um, you'll see that I have my my um, plaque back there, my YouTube plaque. It's just 100,000. Um, you know, I'm nowhere near Paul's you know, and my videos don't look as good as his. I'll never get there because I, I don't I don't want to put that kind of work into it. I, I, I have work I have to do. Uh, so my my value to you is not my video quality, but that you have access to someone who's actually making a living at this. Uh, gamer moments. I've got a question. Do chords always have to be played with simultaneous notes or can they be played in a sequence? No, you can play them one note at a time. Yeah, that would be like, you know, like... Uh, uh, you could play a C chord like this, or you can play it. Yeah. And like I said, that would be, I might call that an ostinato if I were to play, um, uh, you know, if I were to play chords in that manner where I'm, I'm playing them. Or, or, or this might be an arpeggio, you know. You would call that an arpeggio on the piano, but um, on guitar, it's a similar kind of thing. So, yeah. Thank you, uh, Holly, for helping me out catching these questions because I'm not seeing them. Um, but yeah, you can play all notes simultaneously. You can play them one note at a time. Um, and so either either is acceptable for, and both of them are different ways of playing. I mean, it's kind of the difference between finger picking or strumming. You know, that, those are two different approaches uh, to the instrument. And, you know, guitar is one of those instruments. It's just this kind of really fun, and it's a great rhythm instrument tool. You know, there basically is two rhythm instruments. There's piano and there's guitar. And so guitar just kind of allows you to bring in so many elements to it. Um, 
So what was I saying when I, I got sidetracked here? Um, oh, about Paul. Yeah, so Paul came over and, oh, the, oh, the, the YouTube award. So, I you know, technically I've played on Grammy nominated. Have I played on a Grammy winning record? Yeah, I've played on Grammy winning records. Um, uh, Latin Grammys, I played on, you know, I play a lot of records I've worked on have gone gold and platinum and stuff. And so I'll go over to some people's house or, you know, some of my friends, you know, cause so many of my friends are, you know, in the music business, I'll go over to their house and they'll have like 10 gold records up there. Uh, my friend, Josh, I think he, <laughs> I don't even know how many Grammys he has now. Uh, my friend Kook has several Grammys. Uh, a lot of my friends have Grammys and stuff. Uh, uh, and I could technically have one of those, not the, oh, the Grammy statue, but I could have a, a certificate saying that I played on a Grammy record. But it's funny because some of those records I probably were done back in a while ago and I probably got paid $300 for the session. Well, to get that certificate, to get it framed, it's like a $800 or something like that. I'm like, I'm just too cheap. And for years I was too poor. I would just, I'm like, well, I just got in the habit of not getting those things. Um, because usually when I'm working, I'm, by, I'm working by myself. I don't have people over. So I'm not really trying to impress anybody. Anybody that's working with me already knows what I can do. Um, and not, not that, that people are putting stuff up to impress them. But, but the thing was, is that like a lot of times, like a, the, these recordings that are gold and platinum or whatever, you know, I, I work two, three hours on max, maybe, you know, not even. And um, so, but that silver YouTube award represents 11, 12 years of making YouTube videos. Uh, again, kind of a labor of love. I'm doing it for you so that you can have all this information up here. So when I'm dead and gone, you still have it uh, for what it's worth. Um, and, but it, that was, a, that was a, uh, to, that meant something to me. Getting that award was a big deal. In fact, the, the UPS guy wanted to get his picture with me because he knew what it was. Uh, it was pretty cute. And then, and then they only find out that he, his son watches my videos. That was really pretty cool. I was like, oh man. And I, I, he got a picture of me, but I didn't get a picture of him and me. I should have, that would have been really fun. I should have done that. I just wasn't, I was so excited to get it. Get it. My brain wasn't working right. So, hey, Edder, Edder Santana. Tom, I'm really fairly new to the guitar. So I've been trying to get a tone similar to that. What I hear in the, uh, yeah, the glassy. Yeah. And, um, that sound uh, is, I mean, it, it's, somebody commented on the videos like, well, it's easy if you, it's easy to get a good sound with a $99 guitar if you have thousands of dollars of gear. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I guess, uh, the compressor I'm going through, you know, is maybe $100 or $200, I don't even know. Uh, the volume pedal, you don't have to go through a volume pedal, you don't have to go through that compressor. I don't even have to go through my API, which is about a thousand, it's like 800 bucks for an API. Um, I could go right into Logic through a, a converter, and you can get converters for 200 bucks. And then from there, Logic is only $200, and there's GarageBand. I haven't tried to get this sound on GarageBand, but GarageBand is free if you have a Mac. Of course, Macs are expensive. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't have to be a lot of expense. And so the tone I'm getting, I couldn't really get live, you know? <laughs> I mean, live I get that sound. Just dial up a clean sound. That's basically a clean sound with a, a crappy guitar with crappy pickups in the neck position. I mean, the thing is, normally if I want to get that glassy sound on a strat, I go to a mid, I go to an out of phase position, and this is even glassier. Um, If I want to, um, uh, you know, get a good sound like that, I just go clean in a clean amp. And the thing is, you know, a really cheap amp, might you might have a hard time getting a loud clean sound. You might have a problem getting clean sound, but getting over the drummer with a cheap amp is difficult because as soon as you start cranking a cheap amp up, it's going to start breaking up and it's probably not going to be pretty sounding, not going to be the breaking up distorted sound that you want. 
Um, so like a Fender Deluxe, which I think the they, the blackface reissues are about like twelve hundred bucks, something like that. I have a I have a I have a Silverface uh, Deluxe that if I've got to go out and do something live, I probably take that. I've also got uh, I've got a, a two rock that's really super duper clean, uh, but that was expensive. That's probably about a three or four thousand dollars setup. Um, my uh, actually one of my favorite amps um, is my. Sears Silvertone, which was like a poor man's amp back in the 60s. It just sounds great. Um, I, Bob, um, what's his name? Bob, I can't think of his name, who, who's worked on my amps. Um, he works on the Eagles amps and Metallica's amps and stuff like that. So it's a bit of a drag to take him something because I'll bring him an amp and then all of a sudden he'll get 15 amps from Metallica that need service and he'll prioritize them. So I'm on the bottom of the list. <laughs> but, um, uh, but he he loves like his favorite amp is the Sears Silvertone, and this is a guy that works on everybody's amps. So uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I almost you know I like if I'm doing rock solos, I'll use my GNL. Um, a lot of times, if I'm trying to get like somebody say, oh, we're working on doing an AC/DC vibe, like for Apex Legends, I used my Gibson. Th uh, uh, my Gibson um, SG for that, which again, I bought, I found this Gibson SG and you've seen it, it's the black one. It's the one hanging on the wall in the video. Um, I think I paid 800 bucks for that recently. And it's a early seventies Gibson SG, but there is nothing on it that's original except the neck and the body. <laughs> but the, it has those, the antiquity pickups and they just sound great. So I was playing clean through an app at the store in Prescott, Arizona, which is a, a little town in north of Phoenix, like in the mountains, so it's a bit of a drive. But they've got like two or three vintage guitar stores there. It's a, it's kind of a thing there, so it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, so that's um, uh, uh, so I would use that for you know. If, so electric guitars that can kind of change them up depending on the sound we're going for. Um, but yeah, so let's see. Whoa, sorry. Uh, cork sniffing guitar players are the worst. <laughs> Is that French? French guitar players, because <laughs> they, but I'm great. Well, thank you, <laughs> Jomo. I appreciate it, Jomo. Justin, Tom, uh, you said it all starts with a player. Everything else is just tweak, uh, something like that. I, I basically said uh, I did this video a while back. Um, I can post a link to it. Um, called the Signal Path, my sig my Signal Path. Okay, and I really really like this video. It's hugely unpopular. No, not not like in bad negative comments, but um, uh, but more in. Uh, let me go. Let's see. Let me see if I can find this uh, signal. I've only got one. Okay, signals path. Okay. Uh, come here. What? Okay. So here is that video. My studio signal path. People do these videos all the time, where they do. Um, uh, signal path where they talk about oh this is the guitar I use this is the cable this is the pedal board this is you know the cables are important uh, whatever um, you know this is my mic pre this is the 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 studio the engine blah blah, blah the speakers I use I, I get that it's all it's all fun it's all part of gas gear acquisition syndrome um, and it's all important but um, what I did was I did my signal path backwards I started the speakers speaker cables. I went from there to my, you know, interface and into the computer and then back to the interface and into the DI to the microphones or whatever. And I, I talk about, well, but not only that, but it's it's like, what guitar do you choose? Uh, do you use your fingers or do you use a pick? OK, what pick do you use? What gauge strings? What type of strings? Um, how, where's the what's the room sound like? Where's the microphone in relation to the guitar if you're playing acoustic? Um, or if you're miking amps or whatever, you know, you've got all these factors and they all play into your signal path. And it's literally could be dozens and dozens of things in the path from when you strike a string to when it comes out of the speakers. It's really quite, you know, like daunting when you, when you are starting out. Um, but then I, but what I say, when I go, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the idea. The player, yeah, but the idea. If you've got a good idea, and I, I go back to my my the tense that I used on Home to Mama with Justin Bieber and Cody Simpson. 
Okay, Sam Hook wrote the top line on that. And Justin and I have written, gosh, the two of us have written like 30 songs together. Um, so people say he can't write. Some of the first songs he ever wrote were with me. Um, but sadly, most of them never got released. Uh, a good example of a song that he and I wrote is a song called uh, Yellow Raincoat. It's just me on acoustic. It's one pass. It was a guitar hook that I'd been sitting on for six months, uh, saving for when I could play it for Justin to see if he liked it. So I didn't share it with anybody else until I got in the room with Justin. He loved it. He wrote the song over it. and It was a very personal song. Um, he, it was one of the first songs he ever wrote. And it was one of those things where he was talking about some of the stuff he was going through and how he deals with it. And people, when it first, when it first came out, they thought it was Drake because when he recorded it, he was sitting down with his iPhone. We're at Henson Studios. He's sitting down writing lyrics on his iPhone, singing a passage. Josh is in the studio with him. I'm sitting there. Um, it's just the three of us. And, um, and Justin would sing, you know, put on my raincoat, my, no. Put a, you know, it's like he would say no, and Josh would go right back to where he was, hit record, and you know, like two seconds later, Justin would be recording again. And he and go, put on my raincoat, my yellow raincoat. And go, okay, stack. And then Josh would have a new track ready to go. Put on my doubles it, stack. He would stack them. He goes, no, stack. You know, they work so fast together. They just got a. They're like reading each other's mind. And I'm just sitting there fascinated, going, man, this is freaking amazing and I'm watching Justin Bieber write to a song and then Scooter Braun's manager shows up and says what are you working on <laughs> you're not supposed to be working on this he goes oh Tom and Justin wrote a new song and it's like oh well I like it can you put it on can you have it done by tonight and we're like sure <laughs> so so uh Justin went off to go see a um a Clippers game and uh because he was done with his part so Ju Scooter said, can you put some, like, Eric Clapton licks on there? I'm like, okay, it's an E minor. Yeah, I can do some, you know, whatever. You know, I did some some acoustic, he's thinking acoustic Clapton licks. So that's basically what it is. It's me doing licks on top of me and Justin singing on it. And, um, you know, that was just one of those things where he, you know, so he can actually write, um, write really good. And, and that was a song where I'm playing sixth and, Six and major seven, so is it? Basically on acoustic. And then the bridge is. See, that's a six. Isn't that a great sound? E minor seven to D six. And I'm always aware of melodies, right? I'm putting a melody in there. Yeah, so um, so he really liked that. He wrote over it. Actually, he still likes that song. It's funny. When I, and when I went to see him in Indianapolis years ago, we we hung out for a minute before the show, and then... I don't think he normally did it in the show, but he did it in that show with his guitar player at the time, Dan. Uh, Dan Cantor is a friend and a great guy. And he, uh, it was it was so fun to see him sing. And literally 20,000 girls singing along with him. Every word. They knew every word. It was like, wow. That, it was one of the coolest nights of my life, I have to admit. And it was my birthday. <laughs> so you can't beat that. Um, let's see. Uh, about 30 guitar fretboard was a joke. Oh, no, no. I did, no, I'll, I'll, no. 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 I just made it's you're hundred percent right. I am the okay, I said I wasn't gonna show you this because I didn't even notice it until now. Cause see, my perspective on this guitar is here. All right. So I'm looking at the guitar, I'm looking at the neck to see where it was made, and I'm looking at the back of the neck. Look how grimy the back of the neck is. Is that disgusting? And ha and 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 Paul picked this guitar up and had no problems playing it. I just think it's hilarious that <laughs> I'm, I never even noticed it was that dirty. Um, I, I don't like, I do like an unfinished neck, to be honest. I really do like the, it's one of the things about those Schecters in the 80s and stuff. Because when, you know, my hands would sweat and it would get sticky, like, but you get that thing. No, I, you can't offend me. And 
uh, one of the best comments I ever got uh, on one of my videos, I posted a video a second ago of, uh, of me like doing, talking about combinatorics. And it's really old. I got long hair. And somebody commented on, I don't know if it was that video. I can't find it. I've been trying to find this comment, but I can't find it. Somebody said, I didn't know Kathy Bates played guitar. And I literally spit coffee on the screen when I read that. And it wasn't, a, I didn't take it as a dig. I just thought it was hilarious. So I commented on it saying, that's the funniest comment I've ever gotten. And he goes, oh, I didn't mean to offend you. Now, it's, it would be hard to offend me. It would be hard to offend me. Uh, uh, so that's, that's, yeah, don't, don't worry about it, Albert. Yeah, I, I, I loved all the comments. The comments were so great on that video. And I'm going to try to get, if there's any questions up there, I'm going to try to answer them, keep up on it. It's really hard to do because it's just, Paul has so many viewers, and I'm hoping it's a really, really popular video. Um, we've been talking about, you know, like if if it's really popular, I said I'd be happy to do another one when he's here. I'm assuming he's going to come out in January for Nam next year, so I'm happy to hang out with him and we can do another video. We can talk more about the the uh, once the the weird tunings, or we can talk about instruments. Or if I've got another credit that's really cool, I don't know. Uh, you know, I. I the Bieber stuff's really the first artist I ever worked with that was really famous. Uh, pretty much the only artist. Uh, one of the first things I did with him was uh, work on a song with him and Taylor Swift. Uh, but she wasn't in the room. And um, I got groove. Thank you, man. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, what are you saying? I'm loving this. If I try to play a conventional guitar, I'm truly incompetent guitarist. Now Thomas, give me hope. Not saying that you can't do it without blues. Yeah, no, it's like, like I said, the... the <laughs> guitar part that I wrote for Home to Mama, again, I end on that second. See, if I, you know, I end on the nine chord or the, the ninth interval, I'm just playing two notes. I'm just playing. Now I do add to it. I add a fifth, which sounds great. But again, I'm ending on that second. If I had ended on this root, if I'd ended on a pure G chord, have worked now that I hear it, it's kind of nice I kind of like it but there's something like like unresolved and open about that G to A interval and that's what inspired Sam Hook who wrote the top line and that was the first song he and I ever wrote together and it got on a Justin Bieber record which was crazy uh, and we haven't had that kind of success yeah we got 58 that's awesome yeah feel free to hit the like and subscribe um, I see, I've been seeing my subscriber number cut, bumping up a little bit, and that's awesome. Um, I'm here most Mondays. I won't be here next Monday, though. So maybe I will um, go Sunday afternoon or something, but it might not be best for European but people on, in Europe. But uh, So just came from Paul's video. Cop enjoyed it quite a bit. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, it was so fun. Paul's such a great guy. We had a great time that morning. We went and got coffee afterwards, and... Uh, of course, Starbucks. I bought him coffee. He and his, he and his uh, assistant, they're both great. His assistant was a guitar, is a guitar player too. They're both, for he, actually, I, you know, I've been a follower of Paul's for for years now, uh, a subscriber. And um, the thing that caught my eye, of course, was his qu the quality of his videos. I mean, just breathtaking. And his pull focus thing. And I asked him about this. So here's the thing. He was watching me, but I was, you know, he was interviewing me, but I was watching him. And we talked about the pull focus thing. And I think he said something like, he kind of only does that when his wife's available. Like, it's really not easy to do the pull focus thing. And I know that because um, you kind of have to make sure the guitar stays, you know, the camera stays in focus. Or you could record a whole bunch of video and all of a sudden it's focused behind you and not on you. So you're out of focus and, and the stuff behind you is in focus. So, so uh, the pull focus is hard. My last video that I did, if you, if no, my last, the second to last video, the the most recent video, the the mandolin one, I recorded with my cameras in Idlewild. But the video that I dropped sooner than that, because that one took me so long to edit to create all those, you know, all the diagrams and stuff. Um, the the the, um, the 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 string, you know, the the three B dive bomb thing. I recorded that with my new iPhone. I got an iPhone i14 Pro because I thought, you know what? This thing, the camera on this in cinematic mode is pretty stinking good looking. So I'm probably going to record more with this. And it, it interfaces really well with my new laptop. And I've got 
Final Cut Pro. So I'd like to up my game a little bit, but Paul really conceptualizes when he's doing a video, he knows, okay, I'm going to cut in and out here. I'm going to do this. I can, okay, I can make this one. They were even like going, yeah, we can use this. We can use that. We can do this. We can do that. It was like, you know, he really, he's an artist when it comes to, because you have to pre-think a lot of this editing stuff. Like you have to, uh, you know, it, what is it called? In the, in the film industry, a friend of mine was a, an editor for, for films. He actually did, worked on, I think he worked on, Qu with Quint Quentin Tarantino. Um, but when he was first starting, he did, I think he did, what's the, what's the vampire movie he did? He did like the third one, which I don't think ever came out. But um, he, but he, before he was working with Quentin, you know, bigger, bigger directors, he was working for these people that didn't have any budget at all. And they would, they wouldn't get what was called coverage. So they'd like have a guy knocking on a door. The guy would open the door and say, well, hey, come on in. And then the next thing you know, they're sitting at a table. And it's like, he, Bob would be sitting in the in the editing booth by himself with all the re, all the footage, and he'd go, "I can't. There's no way to get them from the door to the table. You can't just instantly appear. It doesn't look right. You have to you have to accommodate to that somehow." So it was it was funny that I never thought about that. And and Paul thinks that way. Like he'll think, like he'll go, "Oh yeah, this no. We got to get this shot. We got to get that shot and everything." And so it's just really really good. From Dust Till Dawn. Thank you so much, Dennis. Yeah. So there was a Dust Till Dawn 3. I don't know that it ever came out, but my friend worked on it with, with Quentin. So he also worked on, I think, Horse Whisperer with Robert Redford. <laughs> and, you you know, editing rooms are really tiny and dark, right? You're just in a little room with a you know, computer. And uh, I think he said uh, <laughs> that uh, Robert Redford had horrible B.O. <laughs> like all natural you know like oh i only use natural and i eat natural and everything is like it was really bad so uh yeah yeah the yeah the um what's the robert fripp tuning i'm gonna look it up right now because you got me answered because i love robert fripp but i didn't realize fripp tuning or, or is it something that you're thinking like uh, but up, up, uh, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, I see. Alter okay. New standard alternative tuning explained, which is what E A D G B E. Okay. Uh, basically, fourth tune with exception of third ergonomic players, right? Okay. All fifths now theory. Okay, but in case you're wondering. The octave finally Fripp settled on G for the highest string. Wow, and the lowest. So he came up with C, G, D, A, E, G. Wow. So tuned down to a C and up to a G. That's a huge range though, and it's fits. So it's kind of like a mandolin tuning in a way. So that which you know I could probably get around okay on it. The only thing the nice thing about mandolin is like. You know, like you do four finger scales, like four fingers per string kind of thing. And on guitar, that gets a little bit stretchy on the bottom frets. You know, up, high, up here, it's not so hard, but most people can't do it. I've never met Fripp, so I don't know what the size of his hands are. I met Holdsworth a couple times, several times, Alan Holdsworth. And every time I shook his hand, my hand just disappeared. <laughs> it's like, where did my hand go? <laughs> he just had giant hands. And you could see him when he played. He just he had this facility. It was insane. Uh, how did I get into making music for games? Somebody asked that. Um, um, who was the first composer? Probably Austin Wintry is the one that I worked on a movie with him and that he was doing a lot of games. And so he just started pulling me in on games. And now I work with like the biggest guys, you know, Jason Graves and Gordy Hobb and Bar Stephen Barton and Austin Wintry among others. Um, so, uh, the thing about games, there's no back end or anything. You don't get any residuals or anything. It's all, whatever you get paid up front is what you get paid. Um, but that's part of the reason why I have so many instruments because it gives the composer I work for lots of tools and palettes that they can use. So I've created a, uh, a spreadsheet for them that they can access on Google docs where they can see my list of instruments. See, I'm slowly inserting like information about the instruments, like the range. So they know how to write for it. And then also putting audio examples in there, and and that way, um, 
you know, if they've got a new project and like, like some of the composers will, when they've got a new project, they want to work with a whole new palette. They don't want to use the same palette they used on the previous project. Um, and so they'll come up with a, a, a new palette and they'll go, okay, I want to try, like I worked with uh, one composer on a comedy and he came over and we experimented with electric bass. And at points we were using two slides going in two different directions and things like that. And we used all that stuff that we did that day. And it was like a, it was like a comedy or something, uh, which is really hard to write for. I think comedies are probably the hardest thing musically to write for. And I think I've written some scripts just for fun. Um, and I've written drama, uh, a, a thriller and a comedy and, uh, and some episodic TV stuff, ideas, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm an idea guy and I get tired of the same TV shows over and over again. So I try to come up with ideas that I've never heard of. And, um, the comedy was by far the hardest to write because when you're writing a script, not unlike making music, when you're writing a script, you're kind of reading it again and again, and again, like you, maybe you'll put it down for a month and then you pick it up and like, okay, where was I? Let me read this thing again. And you get, you know, you get your 40 pages in. Uh, typically you're looking at a page a minute. So if it's a hundred and, you know, if it's an hour and a half movie, you're looking at 90 pages typically. Um, unless like the first scene is, you know, D-Day, World War, D-Day, World War II, <laughs> you know, and it's like, that's one line and that could be, you know, 15 minutes of film. So, um, but, but, but the thing about reading the script over and over again, the a comedy, the jokes stop being funny. And you're like, you start second guessing your jokes. And that's a problem because when people see the movie, then it's, it's the first time they've heard a joke. So it's not that big a deal. So anyway, what's the best song to learn on classical guitar for intermediate player? Um, well, I, gamer, I would say, um, uh, I would, you know, like one of the most, uh, I don't know, it's over there, but you know, you could try to learn, um, you could, like, the easiest... That's not easy. I always thought, like... I thought, like, that to students, it would, beginners. Um, but that's uh, Romance for Guitar, and it's, uh, it's anonymous. Um, Segovia Scales, yeah, you could start working on scales, but, but if you want to learn something, like you could learn... You know, that would get your, your, your bass line and melody line going, like Bach, uh, Jesu, of Joy of Man's Desiring. And in G, I think I generally play it in D, but D is harder. Um, and then, but G is a little bit easier. Um, and sometimes I'll play it up a fret so it sounds wrong. It sounds like really hard to do that, but it's not. I just just move my hand up a fret, and it just sounds all just combobulated. All right, so let's see. Um, yeah, have a glass of wine. Now, if you want to really get into classical guitar, <laughs> that's a different question. And so, yeah, so Sam was Sam was right. You know, like you're you're gonna want to spend. You know, I used to when I was studying classical guitar in college, I spent like an hour on Segovia scales every day an hour on Giuliani arpeggio. So one was for the left hand, one was for the right hand. Well, the scales were also right. And then I would spend like a, uh, an hour on new music and an hour on old music. So you wanna keep your old pieces up to snuff so that you, if you get a gig or something you wanna play them, you've got them. Um, and then you're always wanting to add to your repertoire. So it, you know, most classical guitarists will spend eight hours a day practicing. It's insane. Um, and then there's slur studies, which is not insulting, but people, but slur, slur studies is like, you know, hammering on and things like that. And that's really hard to do on classical guitar. And there's some really good studies for that. Wow. We got 72 likes. This is awesome. Uh, this is awesome info, Tom. Thank you. Any tips for someone looking to have a career full of creating like yours? It's daunting. It is very difficult. I mean, it took me, <clears throat> it took me, <sighs> I mean, when I first worked with Justin, let's see, when was that? 
that when I worked for Justin, I was probably 50 years old or 49. And it was the first time that I put on a pair of headphones and I heard a voice in the ears that I knew from radio and from, from, you know, the world, you know, from stardom or whatever. And I kind of got choked up. It was, he wasn't there. It was, I was playing the guitar for baby, but it was not the song baby, the original, but it was the acoustic version. So I kind of came up with a, a, a kind of a knockoff of the piano part um, on Baby, which was, I probably should do a tutorial on it, but. And it's a simple one, six, four, five progression, very 1950s vibe. Part of the reason why I think the song was really popular, but you'll notice I used a different voicing technique for every one of those because I sometimes I have open strings and sometimes I don't. I think for a B minor, I didn't even, I didn't even play the root. There was no bait B in it, uh, but like on a D, it's just the, uh, the triad plus the sixth. So it's, like, it's simple as that. So they were kind of going for a 50s vibe, right? And then the G, I'm playing like this. And the A, I played like this, because I didn't want to play like this. That's just too much work. So it actually required knowledge of the fretboard and some different techniques to play that, just that simple, you know. So, I, yeah, I don't know that he likes that song anymore. <laughs> he may not have liked it at the time. He's still, like, when I saw him live, and he still does, he's like, his, it's his closer. You imagine that's one of the drags about being a, a famous artist is that you you're kind of pretty much stuck doing all your songs the rest of your life you know even the ones you hate i know that like radiohead never plays creep they the song that this is the most famous song creep they very rarely play it i found, i saw that they played it in france like in 2019 and it shocked people people were shocked it was like and they went freaking crazy because you know radiohead shows are wall-to-wall -wall Radiohead fans. So they get it. They understand why they would never do Creep. But when they did Creep, it was like, it's kind of the coolest thing. It was like, wow, that was a memory. And that's now, and that's one of the things like being a celebrity, you know, uh, I'm not, but, um, but like Justin and people that, you know, I know like, I uh, know the Beckhams and, um, I, you know, I know, just a few, you know, the few celebrities I know or whatever they have this incredible power that you and I don't have. They have the power to give someone a memory for the rest of their lives. And you know who's great at that is Bill Murray. Bill Murray will just show up at somebody's party and do the dishes and then leave. Or he'll sit down and play drums at a house party and then leave. <laughs> or he'll get in someone's wedding. But there's a movie, a documentary about this. All these people that have had uh, interactions with Bill Murray. And he just knows that he can just show up somewhere and he does something, you know... And he'll make a memory for them for the rest of their lives. It's really, really fun. Um, oh, is it, as he modifies the B minor chord, what does he do there, Gary? I forget. I always play it. Oh, 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 the, the very first note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, is that the one where he hits the open E string? Yeah, it's like... Yeah, yeah, that's freaking brilliant. He's a, one of the best rock rhythm guitar players of all time. I mean, it, he just, not, not known for soloing like, like Jimmy Page was, or Eric Clapton or Hendrix. So I, you know, and because he kind of came up in the same group, he probably never, he probably didn't even want to try to compete with those guys, you know? So, oh, it's awesome to have you here. Steve Barry, what's going on? Yeah, we got a good group of people here, just so you know, if you're thinking about subscribing or thinking about hanging out with us. Uh, and you can, I, I posted the Discord link up there. Uh, anytime I do a, a PDF or something for a lesson, like we did last week, we did this thing, capoing, where I talked about all the different positions and, and the best place to capo or alternative places to capo for different keys. Um, uh, those kind of things are all are up in Tom's PDFs and lesson. Uh, I did some bossa nova stuff recently. So this stuff, like these bossa nova grooves are up there. And I try to do 
tabs. This takes me a minute to do these, so I don't always do this kind of stuff. But the the grooves, you know, I put I try to do tabs and music notation. Um, we talked about walking basses, walking bass lines. I mean, just we've just talked about all sorts of stuff. But today is Paul David's day. <laughs> July 17th will always be Paul David's day. <laughs> so, um, and uh, yeah, it's been fun. I'm, I'm, uh, I'll go back on later this after, later today and, and I'll comment on some of the, uh, the post. I've been commenting on some of the posts, uh, people, the posting. Uh, how do I get this to go up? I'm trying to see if I missed anything. Um, I'm loving seeing all the new place, uh, the new faces on here. It really, it's really cool. Michael Glesser, could you give us an example of a video game riff? A video game riff. Uh, yeah, what did I do? Well, so if it's a riff, um, it was probably written by Stephen, like a composer, like Stephen Barton or whatever. Um, I can share with you this. If you want to see something that I did um, with Austin Wintry, um, and he, the music's there, not tab, there's no tab. Um, uh, but I played oud and lute on this, and it was insanely difficult. And part of the reason I work at home, again, I, I said at the beginning of this video that like there's probably a thousand guitar players better than me in LA, but there's the, none of them are better at being Tom Straley than me. So uh, that's what my my clients, that's who they call. Um, I think this is it. Oh, this is it here. So let me grab this. Um, sure. Co copy. Okay. So this is, on this you can see the music for the oud and everything um, that I did. And so there's riffs in there, but it's not, you know. And Austin writes very complex music. But that's part of the reason why I like working from home. Because I can, if I need to punch in a million times to get this thing, this passage down. So a lot of times if it's very difficult, I kind of work it out. You know, I kind of go, okay, let me see if I can get this phrase down like this four bar phrase down on the oud which is an, not tuned like a guitar it doesn't feel like a guitar it wants to fall off my lap and it's fretless <laughs> so it's like everything's conspiring against me on that instrument so i pick up the oud and uh, but i'm getting the you know getting what getting the parts down and then i you know hit record and i you know get four counts into the record or whatever and then i play and i go nope and i hit pause and i hit undo and I try again and I until I get it um, and sometimes I have to punch in like one bar at a time um, you know it just depends musically if it's if it's arpeggiated stuff that's ringing out can't really do it with with some you know Austin hates it when I do this but he <laughs> I will often um, reinvent the guitar and like I'll tune you know I'll like put a you know like I'll I'll put like a, a, a tune down E string down to D or something, and then I'll grab my spider capo and then I'll I'll put it up here, you know, say I don't know, up here at the at the tenth fret because he wanted you know this chord or something. Let's see if I can do something. Oops. Nope. I gotta get the right angle. That works. He wants that chord. Well, I can't. You can't play that chord. That's not really a playable. So I might literally do this and then punch in and record that. So, but as far as being like a specific riff that's a game music, um, dun, 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 you know, there's themes like the apex theme. I can't remember it now, but um, uh, it's always baked into everything that I do for the apex legends. Um, and not that I play, but baked into every, every theme that you'll hear that theme somewhere in there in one of the instruments. It's, Barton is freaking genius. He's just, he did the, he and Gordy Hobb did the Star Wars, the new Star Wars game. I think they did seven hours of music and I think they spent 38 days at Abbey Road Studio One with the London Philharmonic. Can you imagine? 
Uh, Barton keeps threatening to, threatening to bring me to London to work at Abbey Road. I've been to Abbey Road, but I, did, I didn't work there. I just visited. I got the tour of it. I mean, the boys did. And that was a thrill of my life. Um, but, yeah. Life's too short. Oh, thanks for your welcomes. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, let's see. What about, any other questions? Too much coming. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of Canadian smoke. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any right now. We'll probably get fires. We'll, we'll, we're bound to get fires. We had a lot of rain this year, so that just means a lot of fuel. And every time we have a lot of rain, uh, the fires tend to get bigger and more out of control. So um, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. You can't send. Well, actually, there is. They have this thing where they, in California, they, you, you know, this is probably all over the world. It's probably one of the most common things to do for this, but it's just to hire goats. People will hire uh, goat herders to come and, um, and eat all the vegetation on the hills. Holly, have you ever done that? Have you ever hired, or do you have any goats? Holly lives in an area in the mountains in California. And I wonder, I wonder if she ever, I, the thing was, is like, I guess you could just have goats. Goats can be a pain in the butt though, because they will literally eat the bumper off your car if you if you're not careful. <laughs> I mean, goats are just like voracious appetites. That's what they do. Um, but uh, but the California passed a new law mandating that if a goat herder was with the goats, they had to pay them for the, that time. And so all the goat herder companies, I think, are going out of business because they can't afford to pay goat herders minimum wage twenty four seven. So it just it just made their their uh, you know, their whole program more expensive than people are willing to pay. So we're probably back to lawnmowers now on, on Hills, but I don't know if Holly ever, oh, maybe Holly's answering here and I'm not seeing it. Oh, okay. Oh, she's got a tech guy there. Okay, we'll have to remember to ask her later. Hey, Joy, what's going on? Um, yeah, and Bruce, thank you, Bruce. I do... Now, next Monday, I will not be here, though. So I'll probably do, I may try to do something on Sunday, but it won't be in the morning because I'm, I'm playing at church on Sunday morning. Um, but but definitely will. And like I said, today's Paul David's Day. We're just talking about Paul David's. And uh, it was cool. You guys all got to see, like, the other side of this window, right? Like, he, I was sitting here, and he's over there, and the camera was coming this way, which is unusual. I mean, some of my videos show that. Obviously, I sit here and do my videos, but... It was interesting. Just subbed after watching Tom over on Paul David's channel. I uh, had a look-see of this channel and found this broadcast. Off to a great start. <laughs> and you got a shout-out from Tom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and I love that it translates translated in Paul's video that I enjoy what I do. We both do. Um, you know, to be honest, you know, most people, if you, if you get into what you're, you know, I always use this as an example. I, um, what's his name? Um... Uh, Mike Rowe, who did Dirty Jobs, fascinating show, and 100% right. And those dirty jobs tend to pay a lot of money, right? These guys that do the dirty jobs tend to have pretty good, what's the sexiest note? Uh, probably that, that ninth. Probably that ninth is probably the sexist. Um, but Mike Rowe said, be, you know, because he, he was saying that, that, you know, everybody wants to do their, like, passion when they get out of high school or go to college or whatever. I want to be a, I want to be a guitar player. I want to be an actor. I want to be, a, you know, but if everybody did these, the, the, the high profile jobs, that we, we'd all starve to death. You, for one thing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to make a career at it because there'd be too much competition or there wouldn't be any need for it because, there, you can't have movies without movie projectors being made, <laughs> you know? So somebody has to make the movie projectors. But he, he said this thing is totally dead on. It's like, don't do your passion. Have a passion for what you do. And, I mean, the employers love employees who, who love their jobs. And, uh, I, you know, I, if you get paid a little bit more, you might love your job a little more. You know what I mean? It's like a good pain, you know, it doesn't hurt to get a raise every now and then or move up the ladder. But I always use this example. Back in the day, there used to be almost a city block, uh, this magazine 
shop on Hollywood Boulevard and it would have like a block of magazines and you would just go through and it would all be broken up into sections and there would be unsavory sections not to, to say the least but there would be a whole like you know 10 feet of guitar and music magazines like bass player guitar player and guitar world and guitar you know and downbeat and all this you know back when magazines were a thing it was a whole industry that the internet killed right basically uh, but the industry still exists people are still write those magazines still exist but they're online and their revenue model is totally different um, and we're killing a lot less trees we're chopping down a lot less trees not a bad thing uh, but it is a byproduct of that I do like you know I always like having a magazine to peruse I mean I always got guitar player and I got downbeat for a while in different magazines but so there would be this whole section of magazines for me guitar player because I was passionate but if I went further down there all of a sudden I go there's all these plumbing magazines like there's you know bathroom fixture monthly and toilets plus or whatever you know all these magazines about plumbing and I'm like oh my gosh I realized that plumbers are just as passionate about what they do as guitar players are um, and so uh, that was you know that's the thing you you can I, I don't think it would matter what my job was I, and my job is so varied anyway I mean I love YouTubing and I love playing at church and I love teaching you know clinics and I love doing session work and I love writing music and so it's all these different things and I love every one of them they're all very different no no two days are the same uh, nano webs generally I usually have nano webs um, <laughs> Oh, okay, Dennis, uh, just saw the Paul David video. Congrats, thank you, Dennis. Uh, what separates the lives of a touring against a studio composer musician? Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing because I came out here to be a studio musician and I didn't have a clue how to get on tour and I think there was a period of time maybe that I would have done it or wanted to do it. I was kind of jealous. One of the things great about touring is you get really good, at least at the stuff that you're doing, but you know it's if you can get really good at one thing like if you tour with Shakira and you just get her songs nailed and your time is killing and your sound is great and everything it brings all of your other skills up with it right and the confidence you get from playing in front of 20 30 40 50 thousand people will definitely will definitely carry over into everything else you do as a musician or in life um, and so uh, I kind of, but the, the the touring musician, you know, has to, and and the the lifespan of a touring musician is not nearly as long as a session musician. George Deering, who's got to be seventy something, he's been doing it forever since he was in his twenties, and he'll keep doing it. Um, but there are touring guys that are like, yeah, I just I, you know I want to have a I have a friend Edwin um, who tours, plays bass, tours with. Uh, is MD for music director for Camino, uh, uh, what's her name? Cabela, Cabela, uh, shoot, I can't think of her name. I did a guitar lesson to with her and I can't remember her name. Um, Camino Cabela, ah, can't think. Of it. Uh, but he tours with other artists too, and uh, but you know he wanted to settle down, buy a house, get married, do all that kind of stuff. So he was really trying to build up his work in LA so he could stay in town. Um, and so when I was booking. Uh, bands for a couple different church campuses I used him a lot when he was in town and it really helped him out it wasn't like a fortune or anything like that but it was allowing him to make some money and stay in town and get in into more session work um, but the you know so th I think for touring guitar for touring musicians I think it's it's uh, um, endurance is I think a big thing so learning how to be on a plane almost every day or in a hotel room or in a bus every day and going to you know and really conserving your energy um and and then bringing it for the show there's a reason why so many rock stars got addicted to drugs and it was because um they would do a show and the energy you get from you know thousands of people cheering for you would just bring up your your pulse your thing and just imagine playing in front of a you know a hundred thousand people they're all singing your songs 
And then you go back to your hotel, you know, hang out a little bit afterwards, get people, sign some autographs, whatever. Go back to your hotel room and it's bedtime. It ain't going to happen, right? So what happens? Well, they start drinking or they start taking downers or whatever. And then they got to get up early the next morning to take a bus <laughs> to go to the next town to do it all over again. So now they got to take something to kind of get them going because, boy, you know, so they might take some caffeine pills or whatever. And then the next thing you know, they're, they're doing this drug thing. So that doesn't happen anymore because it killed so many people. And, you know, people, they, you know, they learn to, uh, to uh, create a bubble around themselves that would, you know, uh, and, and, and that's why oftentimes singers and, you know, big, big stars and stuff like that are, are branded as divas. And it's, they're not divas, to be honest. They're just like, they, oh, she won't talk to you afterwards. What? She won't talk? What a, what a biatch. <laughs> Sorry, now I have to go PG on my video. Um, no, it's because she can't, she can't talk. Um, Alex's girlfriend had throat surgery. She's an actress. She does a lot of voiceover work. She does a lot of stuff for Disney and stuff. And um, she just had surgery. She can't talk. She hasn't been able to talk for like a month now. And it's driving her crazy. Poor thing. And she's the sweetest thing and she just can't talk. Um, so uh, it's really frustrating. But that's, it's, it's just pure protection, you know. It's like, it's like a guitar player gets off stage. Last thing you're going to do... <laughs> Last thing that, oh, what's his name? Uh, Tommy Emmanuel. Last thing Tommy Emmanuel's going to do after a gig is go, go to the beach and do beach volleyball. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Oh, come on, Tommy. Don't be a jerk. Play beach volleyball with us. Yeah, I don't want to break a nail. You know, it's like I, I can't play volleyball because I'll break a nail. And it's just like nail is part of my, nails are part of my sound. Um, so it's, yeah, so you, you just, you kind of learn to pace yourself, I think, in that world. Uh, studio thing is just like, I, uh, the, that, the, for me, it's patience. It's like, uh, and nobody has as much patience as I have. So I don't think most people would do it. I, I, had a, I, I know people that moved out here when I did and they lasted six months. And at six months after I was out here, six months, I had nothing going on. Uh, within six weeks of moving out here, um, uh, shoot, what's his name? Um, he was in White Hart. Uh, uh, can't think of it. Uh, Great session guitar player, became a record producer, but he was getting, he's working with freaking um, David Bowie. I'm like, wait, how did you get to work with David Bowie in six weeks? Uh, but he, his father was uh, a, uh, an arranger in Nashville, the top guy. So he'd been in studios his whole life. And he would literally, back in the day when you could fly freight, he would fly his big giant refrigerator rig of, of effects and amps and his guitars with him from Nashville to LA and would lose money. Hey, Jeff, what's going on? Um, he would lose money on every session because he was paying, but he wanted people to think he lived in LA. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, so, but the session thing is just, yeah, for me, it's been a lot of patience waiting for the work to show up. Um, and then the writing thing, it was just something that I, opportunities arose um, and now I've, I've learned to take advantage of those. Um, like I said, I work for a lot of composers, a lot of writers. so. I, you know, one composer, you know, he doesn't play guitar and he's working on a show that needs a lot of guitar music. And it's like he could either pay me, you know, to play it and he'd have to write all this music and it would be this big thing. Or I could just write and then he, we would just split the royalties and that's and then he mixes and does all stuff. So uh, anyway, that's uh, why do guitar players bend their strings uh, to sound like a voice, I think um, it. it I, th I, you know, it, I'm trying to think when the first time I heard someone bet it was probably Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of is. Uh, why do guitar players bend their strings? Because piano players can't. <laughs> That's why that's why they have they have the uh, uh, you know the pitch bend the pitch wheel. Let's see, is it? No wait. Oh, it's funny. The pitch wheel doesn't work on this. Yeah, smart because you can't do pitch bend on a piano. But yeah, it's probably because you know uh, piano players can't do it, so they love guitar players love to rub it in. But but bending is kind of one of those things that. Um, 
really you can you can create kind of a distinctive voice with how you bend or what notes you choose to bend to. I mean, I think of like Lukather. I love Steve Lukather. He does like he really into like minor third bends. Again, keep in mind, I like Steve Lukather because I moved out here to be in 1983, right after Toto 4 came out. And I wanted to be Lukather, you know, that's why I moved out here. Um, make sure I got turned down the level here a little bit. Well, kind of in tune. All right, so let me see if I can find my Lukather sound. Hold on. I got a pseudo Lukather sound. Um, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Oh, here it is. So let's see what this sounds like. Let's see if this sounds anything. Yeah. And then I might add some delay. But like he would play, let's say if you're in a minor key, you're in um, E minor. Um, if you look at a minor pentatonic scale, okay, I'm all over the map today. Oh, by the way, take a sip because I changed guitars. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Sam was on it. <laughs> he's out of coffee and I've been changing the guitar so much that's one of our drinking game rules we have a lot of drinking hey Joseph yeah yeah trombone players are the slide players of the of the <laughs> somebody just said that the other day I went oh my gosh you were so right they're the slide players of uh, the horn section um, but the um, if you look at the E minor pentatonic and I'll just play it on the low E string E, or I'll play on a high E string. E, and then the third fret, G, A, B, D, and E. Five notes, pentatonic, five notes. There are two intervals. Intervals are a distance between two notes, okay? There are two intervals. The, the first one, E to G, and the, and the B to D that are minor thirds, meaning it's a, it's a, a major third would be happy. It's minor third, sad. You gotta frown when you do it. So, um, so I can, so you can normally, guitar players will bend a whole step, like they'll bend B, D to E. Right? And one of the things you want to work on is not only being able to bend and bend and tune, you want to be able to have a little vibrato on it, which is nice. You know, again, it's all. But then Lukather, what he would do is he would often bend that minor third. So it would be go one more fret up, but he wouldn't do it there because that would make sense because there's no F in this, but he might go do that. And I love that. B to the D. So the E to the G and the B to the D just sound freaking awesome to me. So that's one of the things I've used in my playing for years, and I got it from Lukather. Went way out of tune. This the A string is starting to slip, I think. I have a feeling it's gonna pop out. <laughs> time to change the strings on this but yeah it's a GNL legacy special I bought this in 1997 I think it's a 98 I really didn't like the color it's okay it's a little flashy for me I'm not usually I kind of like vintage colors it kind of I wish it were like more of a tobacco burst but I, I needed a guitar it was this one the other one was green and I'm like yeah I'm not getting the green one so I got this one because I had to do clinics 
and I wanted a guitar that could get the rock thing and the clean, you know, the strap thing. So it kind of does that. Um, so I bought this right before I got did a bunch of clinics in the '90s. Yeah, it's. <laughs> Another thing that's fun to utilize is groupings, like groupings of five. That was a five. You know, odd number of notes if you can do that. Um, uh, uh, Eric Johnson does that one a lot. Where, where you get this offset, it's really cool because you get this offset of. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. And if you're doing 16th notes, it's like you're playing, five, you know, five notes over a four note rhythm. And so it kind of creates, creates a, a really cool, uh, almost unpredictable sound to it. Rather than if I just went. Then it's like, you know, one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. It's like, okay, I get it. I, I hear that. I hear the 16th note. But if you do this. Everything offset. It's like one E and uh, two E and uh, three E and uh, four. It's hard. That's hard to do, but you know you get the idea. So, all right. Well, it looks like mostly my people here commenting. Are, are, is our numbers down now, or no? We're still at forty-eight. Like, as my as my as the Straley crew will know, uh, I'll probably ha I hang out <laughs> till I practically pass out. But it's great to see all the Paul Davids people here. I, I had so much fun doing it. Paul is exactly as nice. He's exactly how you would imagine. He's, we just had a great time. Super nice guy. Super professional. Um, uh, really intelligent. Knows his stuff. Great player. Uh, we had a we had a fun time. I think. I mean, hey, I may use it as an excuse to come his way because I love going to Europe. We were just in Edinburgh, as you know. Um, in Scotland, and we would, I, I would love to, I loved uh, Holland, we were in Holland in 2018, um, and just, we went at Christmas time, so it was just, I love being in Europe at Christmas time. Uh, I, I, we may do that, we may do that again soon, I don't know, maybe this Christmas. I, um, it depends, because all, all our kids now have significant others, you know, and they got in-laws, and they've got places to go for Christmas and Thanksgiving. So, I, you know, I'm like, okay, we'll figure it out. You know, like if we're not going to have anybody here for Christmas, then that means we could feasibly go somewhere for Christmas, which would be kind of fun. Like I said, I really like, and we could do Southern Europe at Christmas time where it's not so cold, like you could do um, Spain or Italy. Um, I really like being in Scotland in June because, or was it June? Yeah, we were there in June because it wasn't hot. Like, I, I don't know if I'd want to go to Italy in August. Um, but yeah. Oh, Michael, who's Michael? Oh. <laughs> Michael, whatever. Yeah, that was, you know, this. I, I, I think, I, I don't really think I play very good unless I'm playing to a track. If I've got something to play over, I feel like I play a lot better. If I'm just like riffing, you know, I feel like. I'm like, uh, you know, but if I have a, something to play over, I can create melodies and then play off of those. And I, I'm not really, people don't hire me so much for guitar solos. Um, I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be when Al Miola was around. What was that? What's that? Um, I can't remember. A Race with the Devil on the Highway, Midnight, whatever that one was called. I tried to figure that out. It's just so stinking fast. And with the, and, and the thing is, what's interesting, tell me that this isn't true, that you, but um, I feel like muted notes, distorted guitar, even at the same tempo, sounds faster. So if I go like this. Okay. And if I play it muted. To me, if I'm muted, it sounds like I'm playing faster when it's exact same tempo. So there's something about muting that gives it a certain energy. And I actually have a pretty bad right hand technique. 
as far as it goes. Like, I, I see a lot of players, like the gypsy jazz players, that are so stupid fast. I see them doing a free-floating thing, and I just can't do that because I'm going to hit the wrong strings. I've always got to kind of anchor my hand on the bridge, so it can create problems like... Sometimes I'll bend strings out of tune, um, and I'll be like, why is my guitar out of tune? It's like, because it's how you play, you idiot. Um, um, or I mute things when I don't mean to or whatever, but... try to my I, I took guitar lessons a few guitar lessons from Carl Verheyen and his thing was kind of do, to do weird intervals like kind of I think he studied with Joe DiOrio <laughs> So you can practice doing fourths, and one way you can play fourths, like an E minor, instead of going. So that's a. Those are fourths. It's like how do you, you know, how do you do that? You go. You just play them on it on, uh, on the same string, and then skip a string. Sometimes you want to pull in things that like almost sound unplayable. Ah, oh, sorry. That's kind of cool. Flat nine, sharp, major nine, major third, whatever. Um, okay. So, can we do a hundred? Are we do a hundred likes? Really? That's cool. Um, and I think, hopefully we won't have, um, a lot of, uh, ads in this. So when you watch it later, I've been talking about a lot of stuff here. <laughs> we go for two hours now. I'm having fun though. It's, it's always great. Uh, uh, hey Jeff. Yes. Yes. That's a great sound. <laughs> Make one note sing right like i said the, the th great thing about guitar and this sound is a little bit on the over you know over saturated sound so let me do another patch here let me go another one let's see where is that uh, let me do no here we go i don't know we'll see if this sounds any good this is amplitude so i was using guitar rig this is amplitude <laughs> Yeah, it's not bad. Okay, so the again, one of the phenomenal things about guitar versus like piano, for example, even like woodwind instruments, uh, trumpet, trumpet, I think you can play the same note different ways. I know violin, obviously, can play the same note different ways. But like E, that E, it's totally different sounding than this E. The two of them together, or this E. Or this E, or this E, or if I had another, if I had a 24 fret neck. Uh, but yeah, so you can get, you want that woody sound? Or you, you get it here. Steve Ray Vaughn loved to play that shape. playing the root on the second string. But those E's, you know, like... It's just, 
they all have a different timbre. They all have a different character, uh, and and they all have varying ranges of, of uh, dynamics and EQ curves to them. So it's just really fun. The guitar is just fun to play against. So yeah, this is stock, man. This uh, uh, Peter, this is. Okay. Oh, good. I, I got to 120,000. I was watching that. Let's see where we're. Let's see. Sorry, I should. I meant to keep tabs on that. I, I, I lost track. All right. Let me go to my YouTube. Woohoo! Let's celebrate. Everybody hit the party button. Boo, boo, party, 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 boo. Yeah, 120, 169. That's awesome. And then if I go to my analytics, I can see that people are watching my videos right now. So normally I have about 100 views an hour. Now I've got like 700. Thank you, Paul David. <laughs> Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a long time subscriber to Paul. I mean, the re the reason I, okay, there's two reasons why, no, there's one reason why Paul even saw my comment is because I have a hundred thousand subscribers and I have a check after my name. All right. So if someone with a check after their name comments on your video, you're going to reply. And so he read my comment and he, he's pretty good about reading comments and liking comments and stuff. For everybody, but my, you know, mine has a <laughs> everybody's partying. <laughs> um, so it's yeah, so it's kind of what it's 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 one of those things where he, um, he saw my comment and then he remembered it and reached. He commented on the comment and then he reached out um, when he was now you know coming out here and he said, hey, would you be up for it? And I said, hundred percent. Are you kidding me? So uh, yeah, so this so Paul, Peter, this is this is. Uh, 100% stock. I mean, the only thing that is so dirty, I'm ashamed of how filthy my guitars are. I mean, they just sit here. I don't put them away. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of guitars put away, but you can't really see. I got a rack over here of instruments. Uh, nothing on that wall, pretty much. You saw that wall, the painting on it. There's two little instruments there. And then in the hallway, I've got minimum, minimal, uh, little instruments. Again, the reason I have all these little instruments out, these weird ethnic, like from Thailand, from Tahiti, from Russia, from Mexico, you know, from Hawaii, all these weird little instruments out is so that I freaking remember that I have them. Because somebody will say, uh, I'll send, somebody will send me music. I say, hey, can you try this on a, this melody on a couple different instruments? And I'm like, sure. And then I'll do it and send it. And I'll go, oh man, this would have sounded so cool on the charango. I forgot I had a charango. Instead, I can just walk around my studio, in my bathroom, and my, <laughs> I got them all in my bathroom and my in the hallway leading to the bathroom. And I can go. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I'll pull that down and bring it. So that's kind of why I have all those things hanging out, hanging around. How many new subs do I have today? I think I'm up about 700. If I, because I think it, I, I think it was at 119, 500. You know, like in the five to 600 range. So I'm probably up at least 500 since this morning. Now, how many? Um. Uh, how many? Uh, will I get? Uh, ooh, I don't know. Sorry, my itch, my nose itches. My itch noses. Um, I, I I'm hopeful that I get twenty thousand more subscribers out of this. We'll see. I gotta promote it some more. I have put it up on Twitter, but I put it up on my Instagram. I put it up on my personal Facebook for my family and friends. Um, but oftentimes they don't click on any videos I post, just because it's like, what? Well, they're not guitar players, so. Which guitar do I can, number one, um, you know, in here, this is pretty close to my number one, uh, but if I want a Strat sound, so this is, because it's got the hot rails in it, it's got, a, obviously can't get that really glassy Strat sound, so I've got my Justin Bieber Strat, I guess I'm going to call it that, uh, right here, I've used this on a lot of tracks, in fact, uh, there's some unreleased tracks, um, what's the name of that song, um, I really like the guitar part on this one too. Let's see, what is it? Uh, that it actually got into. Um, it got into Justin's. Um, Don't go far. I think is that it. Yeah. So that's. Uh, and f the funny thing is that th this never got released, um, but, so, but somebody snagged it off of the, so it's not technically, this is a, this is a, uh, I'll grab it. The same guitar. Um, I, because I was um, playing um, 
some 11 chords in this. Um, um, because I was playing some 11 chords in this song, I was afraid that they wouldn't hear the bass. So I put a really, it's called on, on Logic, it's called Basement Bass. Um, and it's just, it's like has almost zero tone. It's almost just like a sine wave. Um, it's called Basement Bass. And it's, it, it, when you drop it in, it drops with a really high bass EQ curve. So it, it'll blow up your speakers. So you really have to turn all that off. I just used it to show them that the chords I was playing, like, where is it? Oh, I turned it off. What was it? Was it? All right. I can't remember. What did I do? Um, oh, no. This is a great chord. This was a C major 13th chord. Um, let me turn up a little bit. So I'm doing the rock stuff. I'm just going to a pure B minor. What did I do? I can't. Re it's funny. I'm like, I should do a tutorial on this so I relearn it. Um. diminished thing again it's kind of the same vibe as ETA um, and it got you know it almost got on that record it would have been fun if I don't know if it would have been a hit but it's like but that chord I'm using the voicing on that is it's a great beautiful chord it's jazzy but it it serves a purpose it's kind of a pentatonic D, B minor pentatonic shape with a C in the bass very Pat Metheny type chord so that is, I call it C, and I'm going to do an Alt J. Oops, what did I do? C, Alt J, which creates a triangle, 13. And I'm playing it, it's, uh, what is that? Eight, nothing, nine, nine, ten, and then nothing. So it might be hard to see. You might think it's eight, nine, nine, one, zero, but it's not. It's ten. Okay. <laughs> And I'm playing with it's a four finger chord. It's an adult chord. Okay. There's a C. There's a B. So there's that seventh right there. And there's an E. And there's a thirteenth. There's that thirteenth or A. There's no ninth in there. There's no fifth in there. Again, you don't need all those chords. But that leads really nice to that. And that's what it leads really nice to this B minor seven, which I'm just playing the bottom string and then the, the uh, fourth, third, and second string. And I go to A minor. And I just go to. It took me a minute to get that down. I went. And I think that's just me playing. I don't think there's any overdubs on it. It's just a. It's just a pass. I'm not even sure where that file is now. Um, but unfortunately, that never got released. But it's a, it's a cool, it's kind of, I've got a lot, of, I do that a lot. A lot of, I mean, that's Jimi Hendrix right there. That's not original to me. That, obviously not original, obviously. A lot of guitar players play that chord. But maybe not in pop. So it's kind of bluesy, yeah. It can, yeah. And then this chord is just, Five, 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 five on the top five string. So I'm not playing the bottom string. So what technically it is is kind of like a a C six or an A minor seven over D. You can think of it as a D D eleven chord. Then I do the D sharp diminished seventh, which is, is really leads really strong to the E minor seven. That's a gospel thing. So I'm kind of pulling in a lot of things in here. I've got, got a little Jimi Hendrix. Pamathini jazz, and then, and then the gospel. This is like a, that's also kind of jazz, or I think of this as Earth, Wind, and Fire. So all of those Hendrix, Pat Metheny, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and gospel, some of my biggest influences. 
And that's actually in one encapsulated two bar riff that shows you that we all are as guitar players, an amalgam of our influences, right? Nobody sounds exactly like Steve Ray Vaughan or exactly like Jimi Hendrix. You can't do it. Um, you sound exactly like you though, whatever that is <laughs> for better or for worse. Oh, I like the sound of going down one fret at a time, alternating between minor seventh and majors. Oh, like this. Yeah. That's very Steely Dan, right? That sounds like Steely Dan. I like the dominant seventh too. But you're right. That's a cool sound, but how do you make that into a song? Now that totally is very Spanish, very pop right now. So you could, I mean, mine kind of did that right with um, uh, ETA. Uh, that re reminds me of. Bill, uh, Bill, um, can't think of his name. Somebody will, somebody will have it. Uh, yeah, Woody Woodpecker. Uh, but yeah, that to keep doing that, hard to turn that into a pop melody. You could probably do a jazz thing over it, right? You know, you could probably come up with something. probably come up with a kind of a fun melody over pop wise or any other genre it might be tough um, but it is it is a in the minor the other thing you could do so for example like um, you could do that do uh, a Jeff you could take like that so instead of playing maybe playing um, like here F major 7 you could play F major 9 so you have an A on top then you go to the E minor. I'm sorry, we have a G on top now. And you go to E minor. And so you still have a G on top. And then you go to you go to um, uh, E major seven. You still have a G on top. And then you go to like a D minor eleven. Now you have this common tone, kind of this thread. And so now there's a melody there you could do like almost like a, a Joe Beam kind of vibe. pretty tune right um, and that's you know right what I was just doing right there is kind of how I write it's like uh, sometimes I'll sit up with a drum groove a tempo or whatever I won't usually settle on a tempo though I'll sit down without any beats or anything like that sometimes if I need inspiration I'll throw a beat down but if I, I'm trying to get an idea uh, then I'll find the perfect tempo for it I'll usually record it right away without a click and then I'll listen back to it and I'll get out my metronome and try to tap in the tempo or find go, okay, okay, that's 88 BPM, I'm maybe 89. Okay, let me try 89. No, 89 just feels a little too fast. Let me try 88. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, maybe 87.5, let me go there, you know. And um, so, you, you know, then once I find that, then I'll probably drop in a beat or or at least a boom, tap, boom, boom, pat, boom, pat, you know, kick, snare, hi-hat maybe, something like that. Just so I'm not playing against a click, 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 click. It's a, you know, that's uninspiring. So I'll, I'll play against something that's a little bit more inspiring. Um, so, okay, Zaria, nice to meet you.
yeah you'll get welcomed here <laughs> all you Paul David's people you'll 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 jump on here and you'll get you'll get hounded here we got we got moderators I don't think Holly's back yet but Bob's here Dennis and and Bruce is here plus all the regulars Joseph and Sam uh, uh mm. let's see earth wind and fire yeah earth wind and fire is so freaking great and you know like you can do you know just 11th chords like just bar like this mm. I'm playing the middle four strings and I'm playing C, F, B flat, D. So it's basically a B flat over a C chord. You could call it a C11. Go up two frets, go one fret, two frets, one fret, two frets. <laughs> That's just like, if you want to do something stereotypical, Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> you can put ninths. I got off somewhere but yeah that's a, to me that's a really earth wind and fire thing you could do it on the low you know you know how I discovered that was I back in the 90s when I was doing clinics Roland was one of the sponsors and they gave me a, a rolling guitar synth and I hate guitar synths and uh, I'm like just hire a synth player don't take it someone's job away just hire you need a guitar player so I'll be the guitar player let him be the synth player so I had to demo this thing. Uh, I forget what was it was, the GR5 or something. I, Alex has it now. <laughs> but you have to put the pickup in. So it does. you can't just plug a guitar in. In fact, this is the guitar I used. The GNL is the one I used. And you can still see, if you look closely, you can see there's a hole here and there's a hole here where my guitar tech mounted it. So it was behind this pickup. It fit in there, but barely. It was a hex pickup, so it would pick up that. And so I had to demo this thing. So I pull up the horn patch and I do, bah, 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 bah. you know, it's kind of like I could do it on piano. Let's see if I let's see. I, well, I I think I can do it on piano. Let's see. Um, ba, 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 where like I need horns, studio horns. Okay, seven P. Let's go with a giant. Sugar Hill horn section. <laughs> I don't like the sound of that one. Let's see what the elements section. Okay, that's what this this is supposed to elements section, I guess, is supposed to sound like Earth, Wind, and Fire, right? Well, that's but that, it's not bad, but goes oh here <laughs> but I would play that on the the guitar synth and everybody would be like whoa that sounds like earth wind and fire because <laughs> I'm going but with a horn sound uh, I figured I also did uh, Bob Newhart theme yeah I was like I, I, pretty much I, you could tell I was like not happy to have to do this so I was picking kind of cheesy things to play on this on it you know uh, you know the thing that was cool was maybe the organ sound was kind of cool you know you always kind of want to have that vibe uh, a lot of times when I'm soloing um, like if I'm soloing like this kind of sound you know I'm thinking to myself uh, you, uh, there's a documentary I haven't seen it a friend of mine saw it and loved it but uh, there's a new documentary out, a sad sad uh, on uh, Danny Gatton, one of my favorite guitar players. He was a kid, you know, growing up and stuff. But um, a lot of times I'm imagining kind of a B3 kind of sound, right? A kind of a George Benson thing too. He would kind of make the, because remember George Benson got to start with Jimmy, Jimmy Smith, who was a, is like a beast of jazz organist like the best so he kind of would do like that kind of stuff and so you get the right time you roll up your that's a bit pick a better key just that blues scale just just kind of sounds like a b3 well 
Danny Gatton would do this thing. He did this, and I went. He did this. We went. went. Right? Organists would do this. I don't have an organ up. But, yeah, they would do this where they're hitting the note, kind of like uh, Angry Young Man by Billy Joel. And he'd be like. But he would do it with his fingers like he would do. Where he would like, it's like, whoa, it's just like beast mode. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, it's like that. It's like that. It's like that. It's like that. practice that try to keep the keep the the, the drone going 16th notes and then you know like obviously start look slower but... and I'm plucking I'm plucking the bass note or the drone note when I'm hitting the chords too so so I'm already down so I'm plucking down and then up, up with the fingers sorry that might be too loud yeah, it's a, it's a form of chicken picking. A lot of chicken picking I usually is. You know, this was like, it, it is de definitely chicken picking, but it's like, man, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not even chicken picking there. I'm using all pick there. I just, I, my, my my hybrid technique is not the greatest. I'm, I'm, I'm good with the fingers and I'm good with the pick. The hybrid thing for some reason is just. For one thing, I don't like to pick too much on electric because I'm always, car, you know, cutting off my nails. Um, See what else we got? Any other questions? Blood, sounds like blood, sweat, tears. Yeah, the horn section. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, let's see. Oh, you saw Danny Gatton live oh, in in Virginia. That makes it because he's a DC boy, right? <laughs> Using full beer bottles to slide. Yeah, he was a showman. He was so sad. He committed suicide. It's just like, oh my gosh. Look, hey, if any of you are struggling with that. Call for help before you need it. I almost drowned in Lake Michigan many years ago, and I basically swallowed. I'm a good swimmer. I'm a, okay. I'm a good swimmer. And I went out on Lake Michigan with my daughter. Thank God she didn't go all the way out with me. But I was like, hey, because from our, the deck we were at the house we were standing, we could see the sandbars. And I'm like, hey, let's go out. It's always fun to stand on the sandbar, and you're way out there, and you're in knee-deep water, and it looks fun. And it looks, it looks crazy. And you're like, whoa. And so um, we could see three sandbars. So I was like, hey, Emma, let's go out. Let's go swim out to the third. Let's go out to the third sandbar. We'd done it before, years before. You know, every year we kind of did it. And so she said, sure. So I said, okay, we got to the first one. And, we, you know, it's just a few feet out. We actually walked to it. And, we, and then we were up and we were like in ankle deep water. Then we go to the next one. We had to swim a little bit. We get to like knee deep water. And I'm like, okay, you stay here. I'll go to the next one. And, uh, and, um, and I'll let you know where, how far it is, and then you can come out to me. And she's like, okay. So I start getting out there, and the water's really cold. I'm really out of shape, and I'm getting out there, and I think I should be over the sandbar by now. So I go vertical, and I go underwater, and I'm like, nope. So I go back up, and I start swimming, and I try to go out some more. And I go vertical again and try to touch, and I'm like, yeah, it's there. I felt the floor, but it was like eight feet deep there. So I'm like, no, nope, I got to keep going. So I, I go out a little bit further. I'm like, okay, I'm not, yeah, I, I'm going to stop. If I could, if it's not here, I'm going to turn around and come back. So I get out there. I go under again. And now, you know, now my body is really cold because I've been under the water. It's, it's, I'm starting to get cold. And so I'm like, okay, that's it. I give up. I, and I turn to her and I go, no, I, I can't. No, I'm coming in. So I start trying to come in. And I don't know if it's at my arm. I had no strength. I had no pull. Um, or the, but there was current, it was pulling me out. I was going the wrong way. 
and I swim in the ocean in LA and I know, okay, swim parallel to the shore. So I start swimming parallel to the shore and I'm just losing all my, I, I, and this is a lake, so there's no salt water. So you're, you're going to sink. So I said, okay, let me just take a break and try to rest. I lay on my back, but of course on my back, I'm not floating very well. And a wave hits my face and a bunch of water goes up my nose, triggers the, the panic, you know, trigger. And that was when I, I saw someone way out there on a jet ski or something. And I start waving at them and they wave back. <laughs> And then, so I'm like, uh, and my, my wife and my kids, and Emma's out there and, and my sisters are on the beach and, and I turn and I just go, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to ask for help before I think I need it. And I started yelling. I literally yelled help, just help. And, um, and my sisters were like, oh, he, Tom is always joking around. <laughs> Beth, you know, Beth knows me. She's like. Yeah, my sisters think they know me, but my wife knows me and she goes, yeah, I don't think he would joke about something like that. So I'm like, I'm like, help, help. And, and so uh, Beth gets up and I see her get up and I'm like, OK, and then she gets a she gets an inner tube or like a, a, a raft and she starts rowing out. And then my brother in law gets in the rowboat. And he comes out and gets to me faster and they're more scared than I am. By the time they they are turned around. But I knew that if I went under again, I probably wasn't going to come back up. So I was. I, but, you know, I felt like I was asking for help before I needed it, you know, you know what I mean? So, and that's the same thing with depression. It's like, you're a little blue, talk to someone, you know, uh, be with people, get out, go, go to a freaking Starbucks and sit in a Starbucks. You'll feel better just having the energy of other people around you. Go for a long walk, um, but don't, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, depression is, is a, a sad thing. So yeah, it's embarrassing to ask for help. It really is. I was embarrassed, but when I finally got on shore, Beth put her hand on my shoulder. She goes, you're as cold as an ice cube. And I said, I know And my, my sisters by then were like, shoot, you, you know, and then I got on Facebook and this was like, this was like when beginning of Facebook or now, you know, it was like 2011 or something, 2010. I get on Facebook and I, um, uh, I say, uh, uh, you know, I say, oh, well, I almost drowned in, in Lake Michigan. I got caught in Riptide or something. And and then all my California friends were like, yeah, that, the lakes are nothing. There's no Riptides and lakes and all this. And I'm like going, really? Am I being like a big baby here? And I pulled up an article. I Googled it and I pulled up an article and literally on just a few houses down, Three men or two little boys and a father drowned. The boys started to get in trouble. The dad went out there and they all three drowned just on the, the year before on the on Lake Michigan. So, you know, Lake Michigan's a big lake. You can't see across it. It's not like your typical like little lake. And, and those lakes do not have any kind of, uh, uh, you know, tide pole or anything like that. So um, <laughs> music and wisdom. Yeah, I mean, I'm an open book here. I, I've gotten off subject, so all the Paul David people are leaving. They're like, uh, okay, well, now now I'm going to unsubscribe. <laughs> Let's see where we're at. Let me check the subscription numbers. I'm going to re refresh. Okay, we were at 120, 177. Refresh. Well, 232 now. So just in that time amount of time, we've gotten about another 55 subscribers. I'll take them. Welcome, Paul David fans. I appreciate it. Um, and we'll, um, uh, the wedge in Newport, the wedge in Newport is insanely dangerous because you have those, the, the jetties, which are great, but the, they create this pull. They like the waves come in and then they go that way. And that's why you swing. And I've gotten caught in that before in Newport. I've been caught in the, I didn't drown. I was like, I was like, I think I'm in a, I think, I, and I didn't have a surfboard. I was just swimming. I, I think I said I think I'm in a, a, a you know a riptide and um, and they didn't have warnings up usually they'll have warnings up and I think I was in a little riptide but I swam parallel to the shore for a little bit and I was in, I was young I was like 22 years old so I was in great shape and then I came back in but but at first when I tried to come back in I felt like I wasn't making any progress and then I went parallel. And, but it's easier in the ocean because you have salt water and you're, you're more buoyant in the ocean. So, yeah, 
Sam, that's right. Sam lives up in, he knows exactly where I'm talking about. We were in Pentwater, Michigan, but he knows exactly where we're talking about. Um, and there's, there's no one to rescue. They don't have any, you know, in, in, in Newport in the summer, in particular, in the winter, they don't have anybody at every lifeguard station. But that's why they have lifeguard stations, because so many people get in trouble out there. Yeah, drowning, not waving. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So I got caught in one of those. Fortunately, I didn't, it didn't, I didn't succumb. Yeah, it's a yeah. Waves are freaking powerful. I mean, I remember when I was a little kid and when we went to Naples, Florida, to see my grandparents and my sister and I were out in out in the Gulf and I was probably five, and I got caught in a, a, a wave that hit me and knocked me over and I started rolling in it as it was coming in, and I got out and was like, <gasps> I was all scared, almost started to cry, and my sister was like, shh, shh, <laughs> she said, don't don't say anything or mom won't let us swim in the Gulf. We were dodging, you know, I remember one year we had to, in the Gulf, we had to dodge jellyfish. Like, you didn't want to step on a jellyfish. And they'd be in the water, and you'd be like, ah, oh, don't touch a jellyfish. It was like, I can't believe we swam in that. Numbers, 21, 22, that's crazy. <clears throat> Claudio, had similar experience, but in a river. Yeah, rivers can haul A. We used to go to this river, the Manistee. Sam, you know the Manistee. There's, I don't know if you've ever been to the Rollaways, Sam. I don't know if it's, that's, we called it the Rollaways, but it's a dune that's like literally not 45 degree, but it's steeper than 45 degrees. And we would run down a dune and it goes into this river. And then we would run back up and then run down, you know, it was like this crazy, we just kids, you know, and it was a pretty steep dune. And um, I think I could probably find it on a map if I look for it. I, I should, I should try to find it and mark it. Um, <coughs> but um, they had a rope and you could swing out over the river and the river is doing this like all through like Michigan the Manistee is very windy and um, you would swing out on the rope and literally as soon as you hit the water you had to start making your way towards the, the sand dune or you're gonna go around the corner <laughs> and, then, and then it's like then it's all like briars and trees and branches that you can't, there's no sand or anything. You ha you want to make sure you got back as a, and I was this kid and we we're just doing this. I can't believe we did this stuff, you know, and we would get, and, and I remember the first few times I did it, I didn't, I barely made it to this, you know, before the river took me down the stream, you know, down, downstream. So crazy. Uh, hi from Portugal. Yay. I want to go to Portugal so bad. I want to go to uh, I want to go to Porto and Lisbon. This looks gorgeous. It's on our list. Maybe that would be a Christmas thing to do because it will be a little warmer there. Um, it might be kind of nice to go there during Christmas time. Um, summertime, I'm trying to. If we're going to go to Europe in the summer, I'm trying to stick to the northern Europe, where I'm not going to get stuck in like 95 degrees and 95 percent humidity. That's just not fun. We got that right now. We're we're pushing 100 today. In fact, we got 100. All the next week, so. Um, oh, you're going camping, nice. On the Osable Oz River, Ken. Okay, yeah, that's right, Ken. Is that different? Different river? That's not the Manistee, though, right? Manistee's its own thing. Yeah, Mike Evans, thank you so much for for joining us. I'm I've been talking for two hours now. You can go back. Actually, almost three hours. <laughs> I'm just welcoming all the Paul David the viewers Paul's the nicest guy he's exactly like he's in the videos I've been a subscriber for Paul for three or four years initially because of the beauty of his videos he does such a great job and I'm way too lazy well I wouldn't say lazy I work hard um, but I, I I'm you know my goal isn't to make these really good videos and part of the thing is too I, as much as I like the video his videos and his he's, he's really good at this some people chop too much right and the uh, you uh, or they cut out like I'll leave all my stutters in the, I've, I've been cutting out some of the ums or what it was I say okay a lot and when I'm editing my videos I realize I'm like I'm like the, the teacher in South Park okay okay I'm like, oh my gosh, I said, okay, how many times in this video? So sometimes if you see a chop, it's because I'm just getting rid of the, okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think I appeal to older viewers because older viewers like in their 50s and 60s, they don't like all that choppy, choppy, choppy thing. Just talk to me. And that's kind of what you're going to get from my videos. It's just me 
sharing something that I'm passionate about. Uh, and hopefully that comes through. So, oh, Jeff likes my stories. Well, that's good. Or you love my stories. Well, that's even better. Um, I got some groove. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been pl I played with great musicians my whole life. I played in a funk R&B band back when I was in just out of high school in Indiana. Um, got to play with some great players, players that played with uh, like uh, the guitar. The other guitar player uh, was a guy that played in an, a funk band called Manchild that um, Babyface was in. I think Babyface was in Manchild in Indianapolis. And so um, I, you know, I got kind of got schooled. Um, I mean, we did all sorts of different stuff. We did a lot of Earth, Wind & Fire, a lot of Commodores. We did Toto. Uh, disco was kind of big. I, I got stolen from my high school band by the um, trumpet player in this band. Um, and these guys were all like 10 years older than me. So I, I got to play with, when I was 18 years old, I was playing with guys in their 20, late 20s and that had been playing funk and R&B and stuff like that. So I got a lot of my, I feel like a lot of my feel and my groove, and my, you know, particularly my picking grooves um, came from that. One thing, one bummer about the Paul David's, and now if you watch it again, you'll notice, but I, so I'd updated Logic, and Logic started doing this thing, and this probably, I'm going to actually, today I'm going to try to find if, there, if, it's an, if it's a setting that I could turn off. But it started doing this thing that if I'm in one, like here I'm on this Gnl Blues sound. If I go, oh no, I want to be on the Squire sound, on, on the Just a Beaver sound. Now it's doing both of them. Normally, if I clicked on a different track, it would unenable the other track and only enable the track I was clicked on. Well, if you look at my DAW, the digital audio workstation, the logic behind me when I'm talking to Paul Davids, Paul Davids, um, you'll see two orange lights, and that means that two tracks are on. That's why you hear all that echo. And the original sound, which is this, the echo is there, but it's really, really subtle. I think it's at literally two or three percent. Uh, in fact, it might not even be in this sound. Let me see. Yeah, it's. I got the mix at. Well, it says twenty-five percent, but the feedback, the levels are low, so you really can't hear that. So if I go up, like if I turn it up. And it's not a, a simple pattern. It's it's a weird pattern. It's just to give the guitar part a little depth. But I was really bummed, and, and I noticed it while we were filming. But it, by then, we'd been filming for like an hour and a half. And I was like, I'm sorry, Paul. That The sound we got wasn't the, quite the same. And he's, he was fine with it. Uh, he made it work. Uh, and so, but it's just, you could see it back there. I'm like, dang it. I was so upset about that. That was the, what, you know, the only regret I have from that day. It was such a... Such a fun uh, day. But yeah, the right hand stuff, the uh, playing electric with fingers, what's really funny about that, when you when I play clear, like clean sound with my fingers on electric on songs, I'll get people will comment all the time like, I really love it when Justin does an acoustic thing. And I'm like, yeah, that wasn't acoustic, that's electric. It's just not distorted. You know, it doesn't sound like a rock guitar. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, and there, there, there's another one that I, I put a link to um, that is an unreleased track. So this is illegal up here, but um, you can totally listen to it. Same guitar, same setup, basically. Um, and it's called, uh, well, I don't remember if it's called Don't Go Far. Somebody just uploaded this. And is there beats in this? Yeah, so there's. There's beats in this, um, so it was it got produced. But the funny thing is that they call uh, they said, "Hey, can you?" I sent the demo and I added a very subtle, like um, round bass synthesizer, just because I play in a in this not not in ETA, but in this other song called I think it's called "Don't Go Far." But that's you can click on that and. Um, But I was afraid they wouldn't hear that D note, that they would think they would think it was A. So I put that synth bass in there just so they could hear.
which I thought was a cool bass line. Real simple, but... I did something like that. Which, again, that... This is something I kind of went... I hadn't ever heard anyone do it. The, the really common R&B thing from the 70s, I think it maybe goes back to the 60s, but is doing fourths. Fourths are really common, right? So you'd be playing like... You know, fourths are really common in, the, in any major scale. is just chock full of fourths. You can play fourths all over the place. So I, I just said, well, let me, what happens if I invert them? And so that's why I kind of came up with that, you know, that lick. And it just sounds a little bit like weirder than fourths. And I also did it on ET. That's no, when I did that. Um, and the thing was, is I'd never done that before until I played it. The first time I did that was the first time I'd ever done that. I was just like, I was just vibing. Like I told Paul, what I was doing in that example was I assumed that they were going to take um, this and loop it. Because that's kind of what a lot of what was going on at the time they were doing. And this is 2018. And so I, um, but so once I got like four times through that I thought, okay, one of these is going to be vibey enough for them to use. Then I started messing around with it. Started doing more of the... Or... That, you know, doing different things. Um, they ended up using all of it, which was really, really fun. And I love that, that it wasn't a loop. It's, it's a lot of... There's a couple times where you copy and paste, you know, like, and it goes, oh, this is definitely a vibe we want to repeat. Uh, but for the most part, there's a lot of different things. And I think when I'm, I don't know that I'd ever done that before in my life until that very moment. I'm just kind of the, it's the zone, okay? I, I'm, I should do a video on it, but you've one of the things you've got to learn as a guitar player, as, as God, I, I don't care what you do. <laughs> if you're an attorney in front of a jury, you got to get in that zone. And so, you know, you get in that zone, the, the, the zone is a lot bigger with ability. You know, if you have very minimal ability, your zone is really small. But, I, you know, with the more ability you have, the more skill set you have, the more knowledge you have, the more ideas you have, the bigger your zone is. So my goal is, and, and you know, with that song in particular, I had a beat going. So I was playing, I wasn't playing to a click, I was playing to a beat. So I was semi-inspired. I kind of had a cool progression that I liked. And then I'm just kind of going with it. And I'm in this zone. And I think that was, I did two passes. And that was the second pass. And it was one take, like five minutes. And that's just, you know, when you, you get in that zone, you kind of know it. And you want to live in that zone. I just don't. I, I hate it when I play live and I've got a solo and I can't get in the zone. It's like, dang it, I want to be in the zone. And I, at home, I can get in the zone really easy. It's like, I play so great in my bedroom. <laughs> but at the gig, I suck. Uh, you know, and so that's. That's just kind of how it is. You know, you, you, there's, there's certain things that's on. And when I'm working with singers, in fact, I've got to work on something today for a singer. Um, when I'm working with singers, you know, that's one of the things I notice that they get in the zone, whatever that means. It may mean don't talk to me. It may mean talk to me. It may mean I got to be in a room by myself. It may mean I got to be in a room with a bunch of people. It may mean I need to study this thing and know it and have it backwards and forwards. It may mean I don't want to hear it until I do it. Whatever the zone is a different place for everybody and you get to it in a different place for everybody. I was talking about with touring, you know, it's like you got to find a way to be able to have endurance when you tour so that you don't burn yourself out. You don't get in this trap of, of taking downers at night to go to sleep and uppers before the show to get up for the show. You know, you've got to be able to conserve your energy. And it's kind of the same thing. It's the same thing, but it's true for anything. You know, like tennis players, you know, get in that zone. NFL players, you know, you got to be in that zone on game, game day. You know, it's the, you got to get your game face on. So, um, oh yeah, I, sorry I gave you too much to study on this. A lot of talking. How did I get started in music, Tom? Um, I mean, that's that's a long. I knew when I was thirteen, um, I wanted to play guitar for a living, 
At 15, I discovered that there was this job called LA Session, the session Work in Los Angeles, recording on movies and TV shows and records. Once I discovered that, then all of my focus went on getting to LA and trying to get to LA with the skill sets that I needed. However, when I got to LA, I didn't have gear. Like I was, I didn't have money. I was 21 years old. I was teaching guitar lessons. I was playing in a band, that funk band I was telling you about. Um, so I kind of came to LA with really embarrassing gear. So it kind of took me, and, and I'm not saying the gear held me back. My skill sets were still weren't there. I was no way, even if I had Steve Lukather's setup, there was no way I was going to compete with Steve Lukather. Um, if I had Lee Rittenauer, Larry Carlton, or Jay Graydon, those were all the guitar, Tommy Tedesco. If I had their gear, I still wasn't any threat to them at all. I just, I got my career by building the relationships. I always say it's not who you know, it's who knows you. See, Justin knows me. I, you know, I would get called like for ETA. They called me and asked me for ideas. And so that was one of several ideas I sent. Um, and in fact, this, I think this don't go far was another one. So they used a couple of the ideas at least, uh, but only one of them got released. Um, but it's, it was, you know, the, the Bieber connection was a, 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 a friend of mine recommended me to this producer and I, in the nineties and I started working for Cucurell and Cook was living in Glendale, lived in Pasadena. They're right next to each other. And I would come over and do $50 sessions. I would spend three hours at his house playing on, you know, pretty mediocre, not his work was great, but just for mediocre singers doing vanity projects. And I would come in and he was like, he had worked with some pretty big people. Like he, he was, he worked with, um, he'd done uh, backgrounds and demo vocals for David Foster and, um, others and so he knew this guitar player named Michael Thompson who's a big guy in town and he was trying to get Michael Thompson sounds out of me I was like his poor man's Michael Thompson and so Cook would kind of direct me and go no 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 get this sound or he would yell at me make go make it snubby and I'm like I don't know what that means you know and I would keep playing and grooving until I'm finally like yeah that's it that's the sound he wanted you know on this track and so I um, mean it was mostly like pop tracks and things and then Cook moved to Atlanta and started working with his cousin, Tricky Stewart. And, and I'm just telling you how I got connected with Beaver. But so ultimately they ended up producing, uh, he and his cousins wrote um, The Dream. And so The Dream is a, one of his cousins or, or Tricky's, he's Tricky's cousin and Tr Tricky and Dream are a team or whatever, but they wrote Baby. And then, so they recorded that. They also wrote, I think Kook wrote a song wrote Umbrella, and originally I think it was for um, Britney Spears, and she didn't like it, and so then Mary J. Blige recorded it, and they were excited about that, but then she, the, they, they dropped it because it was like the 13th song on the record, so they didn't, they dropped that, and then they were working with Chris Brown, and Chris Brown's girlfriend at the time was Rihanna, and so she liked the song, so she recorded it, and it became a smash hit. And Kook bought a house with the money from bought a house in Atlanta with the money from one song. And then they wrote "Single Ladies," put a ring on it. But he brought me, you know, he brought me in. He flew out here. He introduced me to Justin. And then Kook doesn't work. Justin produces his own vocals now. Um, and so, but J Justin will call me to come in, you know, and um, usually on someone else's phone. <laughs> I I had his number once, but it was. Like I texted him a couple times, never got a reply. And I said, I texted one of the, you know, I remember my friend Josh, I said, oh, J Justin doesn't really pretend to reply to text, does he? He goes, oh no, he's already three phones past that. <laughs> he would lose phones or something or whatever. But um, anyway, so yeah, but I, you know, they'll, they'll reach out and I, you know, I haven't done anything with him in a couple of years, uh, but Justin's not, I don't know that he's in the studio and he's not really uh, touring right now. So he's just kind of trying to enjoy life. He's kind of recuperating from those t 10 years of just being all over the world. So, but yeah, that's just one, you know, one relationship led to a lot of this work. And then Justin has led me to other, you know, other people hired me because I've worked with Justin and they want to work with me. So, um, and I try not to milk that. I'm like, I don't like it when someone wants to like hire me so they can put my name on, so they can put Justin's name on their credits or something, right? It's like, I, I've had somebody say, oh, you know, they say, Featuring Justin Bieber's guitar player, Tom. I'm like, I'm not his guitar player.
but they want to put Justin Bieber on their Instagram or whatever so they can have some association. So I don't really like working for people doing that kind of thing. It's like, look, just stand on your own two feet. And you do your thing and make it amazing. Um, which 500 series? I'm tracking through a um, a five uh, uh, API 512C. So API 512C. Um, I'll say, uh, hey, if you want to get one through Amazon and I make some money on it, um, let's see. Let's see if Amazon has API 512Cs. You're going to need a lunchbox if you don't have one, but a lunchbox is, you know, what powers them. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, here's one right here. 850, that's what I paid for mine. Yeah, they're pretty much not gone up at all, which is amazing because with the, with the supply chain issues and, and inflation here's one for 945 i don't know what the difference is but these guys are selling them for so i'll just send it a link so you guys can know what we're talking about uh but yeah i go through that and that's because of jo justin's uh producer josh um that's what he used on my guitar so i've said i like the sound you get with my guitars um so i uh Um, uh, I want to kind of get that same signal path, you know, so, um, so that's, that's what I use, um, for that, for acoustic, I have a, uh, BAE, uh, 1073 clone, uh, basically it's the same as a 1073, almost maybe better than buying an old 1073. If you buy really old pieces, sometimes they just, you know, they go bad, you know, they wear out and stuff. So my stuff's fairly new. Um, Alex, I bought two APIs initially, but Al I gave one of them to Alex, my son, so he has one now. Uh, you know, you you can series five hundred stuff is like guitar pedals. You you can get. I mean, I've got friends that have so many of them, and I'm like, I only need two. I need one for electric, one for acoustic, um, and none of them. They're just a volume knob. They're not tone. There's no compression. Uh, I don't want to mess with anything pre because. When I send tracks, I'll often send the wet sound, that, the sound that I dialed up that inspired me, but I'll also send the dry sound. So if they want to put it through their own amp simulators or whatever and do whatever they want to do to it, that's fine. Usually on pop stuff, they don't. They like my sound. Um, but on acoustics, yeah, I've got, I'll put reverb on and, and compression. And then when I send the files, I'll send the wet and dry. And usually engineers will be like, no, I want to put my own compression on and my own reverbs. And... And so I'm fine with that. That doesn't affect, hurt my feelings in it. Um, which mods are still hanging around? Oh, yeah. I know. I've been here too long. I think all the mods are gone. <laughs> so let's see. The buzz problem we're shooting for Easter ring early on is only happening on the 6th and 7th fret. Oh, okay. 6th and 7th fret, Sam. That's the room. That's that B note. That stupid B note. That's the room. It's the... I see it. Okay, not there. Ooh, it, it's really bad if I turn up. Yeah, it's just the nature of my the, the shape and size of my room. So, all right, I need to go. I've got I forgot I got to work on something with um, the singer Kelly Jekyll. Um, I've got to do an arrangement of a song and then send it to her so she can sing over it. Um, Michael Green, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, a producer, guitarist, and well, I'm looking to buy 500 series gear. Yeah, careful. <laughs> it's so totally. A, oh, the Chandler is amazing. Yeah, the Chandler actually. Okay, so I'm looking at the. I'll, see, I'll never stop talking. Okay, just so you know, I'm looking at the Chandler Red microphone. Okay, it's like five thousand dollars, and it's the one that's the like the. Uh, and I think it looks kind of like a C12. It's kind of a big capsule. But it freaking has a Chandler preamp in it, meaning that the distance from your microphone capsule to your mic pre is this far. So it's got a real immediacy to it. I've used it. I've been in the studio and used it. I've heard it at the NAMM show, which is the worst place to hear it. Um, so I, you know, I, I thought about getting one of those. Um, we'll see. I don't know. If I do it, maybe everybody will notice the difference. I don't know. The mic I use right now is a Gefell. Um, that's uh, they're about fifteen hundred bucks. It's a pretty mod moderately priced microphone for in the business. Um, I could get a TLM one seventy or a, a, one, a, a U sixty seven or U eighty seven. I mean, I would love to get one of those. I should probably have one of those, but 
they're really good for vocals and they're great for guitars. Um, I think we use it with Justin. We use the TLM 170 on a couple things. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got a room tuned in B. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I could, I, there's a door there, so I couldn't put um, a bass trap there. I could put bass traps up high, maybe, um, and in the corner, but I've got my panels there. My main concern was the reflections and the over, over brightness of the room when I first got in here. So I put panels up, but I didn't do bass traps. I could put a bass trap here. Um, I just haven't. I don't like it feels too cluttered and claustrophobic with all those traps in there. And like I said, I'm not I'm not it very rare. It doesn't affect acoustic recording at all. And only rarely if I'm doing a solo and I'm in too loud in the room and I hit a note and woo, jumps out. The funny thing is it's loud in here. But then when I listen to it with headphones, it didn't do it on the track. It might give me a little more sustain on the track. But if I solo the track and put headphones on and remove the room from the equation, it doesn't do that woofy thing. So, so it, you know, if I would, if I was having problems with it, I I would have engineers tell me. And I was just at the Hollywood Bowl, and I ran into two engineers that I work with, uh, kind of indirectly through composers. And I and I I asked them. I said, look, you always let me know if there's anything I can do to get to give you a better sound of what you need. And he. And both of them said the same thing. And they were not like standing next to each other. Then both of them said, you actually send us the best sounding tracks. Like of all the tracks we get from everybody, your tracks always sound amazing. And I said, oh, that's, that's a relief, a huge relief. So uh, let's see. I have a, a, a Neumann. Yeah, TLM 103. Yeah, I think that's a, a Neumann mics in general are phenomenal. I don't have a Neumann. Do I have a Neumann? I don't. I'd love that about C12. I mean, but I think that's a lot of mic for guitar. It's a great piano mic. Um, yeah, I use guitar rig a lot. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think having a having a little bit of compression going into it, and ha like you know, I use with that, and then the the I what is it the UBS ABS I forget ABS I think, and then going into the the uh, API also helps with the make the um, uh, guitar rig sound a little better. I, I, I'm messing with Amplitude. Alex, my son, loves Amplitude. He really prefers Amplitude. Um, I just don't mic. Here's the problem with micing amps is I'm not an engineer. I work with great engineers. My room doesn't sound great. So where am I going to you know, mic it? I'm going to have to have a room for it. I can get a box for it, but then I may not have the best mics. So I, I'm going to have to go out and get you know some ribbon mics, which I'm fine. I don't mind getting ribbon mics. I have I have 57s. I don't have any. Uh, everybody uses the the one one twenty ones. Again, I, um, I, you know, I tend to get the sound. I once I get a sound I like, I, I dial in. And the beauty of in the box stuff is I can book. You know, I can save that sound. I've got hundreds and hundreds thousands of saved sounds. So I can go back if somebody says, "Oh, uh, on this movie that we worked on, we worked on, um, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, I'll say." Uh, Transformers, that sound you got. Can you can you do that uh, this this track in that sound? I, I've still got it. I've got the Transformers sound I used for that specific cue, so I can pull it up. So, and vibe is key. And like I said, the the neurons, the most important signal path is up here. And if you have a good feel and a good vibe, and you relax, um, that's one of the things I've. When I talked about playing really fast, I'm not like I I tend to tense up. And you look at these little kids and, you know, they're like shredding on mandolin or banjo or gypsy jazz. These gypsy jazz kids in France that can just like, they're 10 years old. And, they're, and if you look, look at their faces, they all look bored. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I never realized how much your continence affected your whole psyche, right? Your whole body. They'll they'll be sitting there and, you know, they'll be. Uh, they may be shredding on something. I don't. I don't. I don't really know if I'm good. And they're just kind of like. Uh, and I'm like, how? You know? And I'm not even playing fast. I'm not even playing fast. But they'll they'll be doing stuff, and you <laughs> and you look at their faces like they're like so bored, and that's part of it. I think if you're like. 
you know, you're like, Ugh. if it, if you're tense here, it's going to go to your whole body. It's like, it's very, it sounds Zen, but it's just, it's just physiology. And I'm learning this stuff at 60 years old. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so if, when I learn it, I tend to share it. So, okay. I should get my own coffee brand. Tom's Coffee for Music, yeah. Well, that's funny because I do think that most of the Bieber tracks that I've written were, were written in at night when the coffee is long since worn off uh, because I do tend to rush. So I'll tell you a secret, uh, Michael. Like, here's a little trick that I, I do. I will, uh, I'm a white guy and I've played with, a lot of funk musicians, you know, I played in a, with a lot of, you know, black musicians and I definitely rut. I'm, I'm definitely, you know, here's the beat and you can play ahead, ahead of the beat or you can play behind the beat or you can play right on the beat. But everybody tends to like, uh, I forget who the drummer was with Steve, uh, with, um, with Prince and maybe it was Prince cause he did a lot of his own drumming, but the snare on the, on those hits are like almost a 64th note back, you know, they're laid back. And I tend to play on the front of the beat. So what I will do, Michael, is I will take my track that I did. If I did a funky track or something, I'm listening to a click or I'm listening to it against the thing. And sometimes to me, I listen to it back and I go, wow, it sounds like I'm rushing. So I'll notch it back on logic. You can, you can go to, um, it's this little tab on the left. It's the third tab, fourth tab from the left in the top corner. You click on that and you get all these things like articulation, track zoom, but then there's this nudge value and I have it set to 10 milliseconds. So I'll go back, I'll nudge my guitar tracks to the right about 10 or 20 milliseconds. Now you have to make sure that the you have track that starts at zero. So if you move it that, and then bounce it, it's not gonna work because they're gonna just drop it at zero. You need to have music that start, you know, you need to have a dead air that starts at zero and has maybe 20 milliseconds of nothing, nothing before your stuff comes in. But, but that's just me. You can do it if you like feeling like you're not vibing. Move your guitar 20 milliseconds and see. Oh, and it's like, oh damn, that's what I was feeling. That's the vibe I thought I was doing, but it didn't sound like that when I played it back. So, anyway, hopefully that's helpful. Um, yep. Oh, tr trying to get my own picks. Um, I could talk to I could talk to Gravity. I wouldn't mind having my own picks. I mean, I really like these. Uh, these are the the unpolished edge. I like the unpolished edge because they kind of get that scrapey sound. Um, Gravity 1.5 standard, classic standard 1.5 unpolished. It's kind of a mouthful, uh, but yeah, I'm not I'm not Paul Davids. I'm not, I don't have three and a half million subscribers. Yeah. Phase and time alignment also, I think, definitely has a play in that. Sometimes, um, also, I think the the uh, there's um, um, there's delay, right? There's uh, um, what's it called? You know, if I get in the studio and all, uh, somebody's system is set up weird, and I play and I hear, you know, uh, it's delayed, I'm like, oh, you got to reset your buffers. And so sometimes there's a buffer issue, um, and I and I I know I was in the pocket, but when I listen back, I'm not, and I go move it 20 milliseconds, and I'm like, well, there's that pocket I thought I was playing it. So I, I will, I'm still I probably do am a pocket player. I'm not rushing as much as I think I am. It could be the the, the system, because um, I I mean I've had some of the best drummers in the world tell me my pocket is solid. <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not, you know, I've worked with JR and I've worked with, you know, I, I've worked with, uh, oh gosh, I can't, oh, Will Kennedy from Yellow Jackets, great player. We had a great time playing together. So anyway, yeah, Michael, that, that's, you know, hey, I'm happy to give away the advice. I, you know, I, I, I'm not competitive. I mean, am I going to give you my phone book? No. <laughs> and if I'm going to give anybody a gig, it's going to be my son first. If he wants, if I've got a gig I can't do, I'm going to offer it to my son first. My son gets me gigs, though. I get more gigs from my son than he gets from me. That's what's crazy. Um, my son's kind of skewing towards, he's a session guitar player, songwriter, but record producer is mainly what he's doing now. Um, and so that's really where he's kind of finding his stride. And I think he's going to be very successful. He's light years ahead of me at 30 than where I was at 30. So the zone. Yeah, make a video on that. Yeah, I don't know. that it, Peter, that's a weird thing. You're going to have to... Because I, I feel like the, I could tell you how I get to the zone, 
<laughs> and it's not other than cough caffeine i don't think there's any there's no drugs involved um but yeah it's different for everybody right singers definitely different but zone what, what is the zone that would be a great conversation for paul and i to have uh but it's it's like the zone is one of those things where live players know it when they're there and the good live players can live in a zone for an hour and a half on stage and i think you get to the zone very quickly if you know the material like down pat my friend sean tubbs toured with um a lot of players but she he toured with carrie uh, underwood and when he was playing with her he knew those songs inside out backwards and forwards like as soon as he picked up his guitar on stage he's in the zone for the entire show um uh sean and i go way back i mean i've known sean gosh since the 90s since 92 or something um uh, I met Rick Beato at the NAM show a few years ago. That was really exciting. My wife saw him and said, and she goes, that's Rick Beato. I said, oh my God, it's Rick Beato. So how do you get started as a pro level session musician? Um, yeah, that's everybody's path is different. Um, that's what's so interesting about the whole like Bieber thing. Um, Justin got discovered, uh, what's his name? Um, Scooter Braun discovered him on YouTube. And then, so then what, what happened after that? The record company signed like 20 kids off of YouTube and none of them did anything. Never, none of them went anywhere. I mean, maybe, what's the girl, the blonde girl with the blonde curly hair that plays guitar? She's actually a really good guitar player. I can't think of her name. She's great. She's a super nice kid. And she, she, she was one of those like, she may have been before Justin actually, but she was one of those that got discovered on YouTube kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah, Sean's insanely humble. <laughs> Sean's like a beast. Like, Sean's ten times the guitar player I am. Um, the uh, So, um, you could follow my path, which I don't recommend, because literally my career took 25 years to get going. I would say, um, get us if you don't have a recording system, make sure you get one of anything. It, you know, Logic is $200, but you have to have a Mac. So that's the expensive part. Uh, but have a have a recording set up in your home or in your bedroom or whatever. Start to learn to work with that because m most of your work is going to be, uh, you know, remote. Um, not, this is not a COVID thing. I've been I've been working from home on records and movies and TV shows for 25 years. All from my, you know, I started out on digital performance and then went over to Logic. Um, uh, so that's first and foremost. Then I would say try to get into some writing sessions, uh, you know, recording. I mean, getting good gear helps as far as getting into session work. Um, yeah, we've shattered the record by at least 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, it's because it's Paul David's Day. <laughs> Happy Paul David's Day. Everybody hit the, everybody hit the, woo, hit the, hit the little party hat. Um, They, um, uh, yeah, it, I think, and then what you, you, you may have to do is you may have to move to a town where there is that kind of work, Chicago, Atlanta, Nashville, Miami, LA, New York. I mean, those are the ones that come to mind, maybe Denver. Um, and there's work in every town there's studios in every town. There's a lot of home studios everywhere. So, you know, that's, that's one way you could, you know, um, start to do that uh it depends on what kind of studio work you want to do um a lot if you're working on a lot of records you don't need to read so much if you are um uh if you want to do movies tv shows games things like that you're going to need to learn how to read so you're going to be able to you're going to have to be able to read something like this <laughs> you know uh i don't even know what this is it's in greek uh sam will have to tell me what this says i hope it doesn't say natty nasty words but like this is in nine eight or nine four so yeah i mean it's it's like you got to be able to read that that's and and you might have to be able to read that on 10 different instruments tune 10 different ways uh that's kind of what that's part of the value i bring to my composers i, I can they can send me something they know they can get it played on a lot of different instruments a lot of different ways so yeah it, but everybody's career is different you know you got to find your niche and i i i kind of knew my niche when i was 15 i knew what i wanted to do and i worked towards it and i practiced reading um, I, every day I practice jazz and rock and classical and I had an eight hour a day routine that I did pretty much from the age of 15 to the age of 35 
and um, you know, I mean, almost the point where I would take guitars on vacation with me and I would do that. So, <laughs> thank you, Boogeyman. Everybody, everybody's so kind. Paul's Paul's got great followers. The comments have been so great. Oh, post on Discord. Post what on Discord? What did I? Did I say something I need? Can't see it. Oh, oh, that music. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I see what you're saying. Sam. Uh, no, because then I have to scan it. I don't, yeah. It's, it's. There you go. Can you see that? It's just, I was looking for some, uh, actually, I didn't play this on bazooki. I played this on mandolin. I was looking for, or something, I kind of played at this. Oh, no. I got went blurry. Ah, it's getting foggy here. All right. We broke our record, and now I messed up because I, this, the camera now focused on the paper and now is not focused on me. And it takes a minute for it to like go, wait, what? What am I supposed to focus on? Okay, I'm gonna show you the most amazing lick I've ever played. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm gonna do it like this. I love that story about Tim Pierce going to see Eddie Van Halen before they were Van, you know, before they were famous, before their record came out. And they were playing at Gazzari's on Sunset, on the Sunset Strip. And he would walk in and Eddie would be doing his solos with a back to his back to the audience. <laughs> yeah, it's not focusing because it's like it's I wish I knew how I wish I had a a, a separate like um, sometimes I do this and then come back. Yeah. See it's just not focusing. And give it a second, it'll come back into focus. I'll just tell a story, but anyway, but yeah, Tim Pierce was talking about going to see, I mean, like he was 17 years old and going to see Van Halen and Gazzari sneaking in. I think he had to sneak in because he had to be 21 in most of these places. And, and Eddie would have his back to the audience when he was doing this tapping stuff. And it, 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 I, it was primarily because I think he was just trying to make sure that he was the first guy coming out with this stuff uh, so that nobody copied it and released it before him. But... He not, he's he didn't say that. There we go. He doesn't say it. <laughs> my glasses stopped working. Exactly. Oh, move my hand back slower. Well, I'm not gonna do anything now. But yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try to remember to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, James. You're probably right. That's exactly what has to happen. Yeah, this is what I see. Yeah, I'm I'm blind as a bat. Yeah, I'm I'm completely blind. Without my glasses, I can't see a thing. Yeah, the problem is it's just one of those stupid webcams. Uh, it's it's the Logi something, and it didn't come with any software. I, I wish it came with a software so because to be honest, it's pretty dark in here. But to me, on the what you guys have seen, a lot, I got my windows closed. See if I open California is sunny. Look what happens if I open my windows. See that? It's like stupid bright in here. So I, you know, it just gets all washed out. So I wish I there was a software that came with it, but it didn't. Nothing. And then I'm using um, OBS software, which I think is a PC-based software because it's just not Mac intuitive. It's like, I, I, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I messed up something. Oh, there it goes. Okay, that fixed it. Okay, cool. Never mind. I unmessed it up. All right. I, I keep saying I'm going to log out. I keep, I'm like so happy that we have so many people watching. Usually I have 20, 20 or so people, but... I, I won't be here next Monday. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I have to go somewhere, but um, uh, I might do something on Sunday. So maybe I'll hang it. We'll hang out on Sunday and we could talk. I got to get some work done, uh, but it's awesome. And I'm going to try to get on uh, Paul's video and, and answer any questions that anybody has. Um, and uh, and then, um, you know, it's but his his subscribers are the nicest people. I mean, they're just the sweet, just like mine. I just feel like I have the best subscribers. Uh, I get, I get janky comments every now and then. I get comments that are mean, uh, and in, not in the best spirit, you know? I mean, somebody commented my fretboard was dirty and it is, it's so dirty. And I'm like so embarrassed by that, but it's like, I just, my guitars are out all the time. And I just, you know, and I, generally when I change strings, I do one at a time. I don't take them all off and do them. You know, I do one string at a time. And so then, then you really can't clean the fretboard off. I recently cleaned off, I think, the GNL because it was just nasty. Uh, it, was, it was actually becoming a problematic. So, yeah. Hey, South Africa! Welcome! I guess, do I have to speak with a 
Afrikaner accent. I don't know how to do that. My best friend growing up, his mom was from South Africa, and her accent was so cool. She she was the coolest lady, and uh, and she was she grew up in South Africa, so uh, she had a great accent. It's like the probably the first person I ever knew that had a you know because he was little kids that had an accent. So in London, I was in London just a couple weeks ago. Uh, I was there. Oh, actually, I was just in Windsor. Uh, we were in Edinburgh, and I flew. We we stayed in Windsor just. I flew in and out of London, but I didn't want to have a problem with connections. So I went ahead and we spent a night. Our, our hotel was right on the Thames. It was wonderful. It was 80 degrees too when we were there and people were like not wearing shirts and stuff and they were out on their boats and there were, it was, I had no idea that there, you could like just go out on a boat on the Thames and just go for it. Now the speed limit's super slow, like no water skiing, which is a bummer, but I get it because this can be, that would be very dangerous. But, yeah, yeah, I don't know any Brits that know how to water ski. I, I grew up water skiing, but I'm not very good. Um, okay, so anyway, thanks for all the new subs. Let's, okay, let me look at the new sub, because I've gained like about six, seven hundred new subs. Let me refresh here. Okay, 120,331. So I've gotten almost a thousand new subs today, just from Paul's video. I love it. I'm going to do a little more promoting on that too, but uh, it was great. It was great meeting him and getting to hang with him. And I, I said, if I'm happy to do another one, if he wants to do another one, I said, if it's really popular, I'd be happy to get together when we're at the NAMM show. If he comes out for the NAMM show, we can get together again. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, it's uh, um it's a, it's, yeah, it, it was so much fun that day. You know, I felt like I had a movie star in my house. He looks like a movie star, doesn't he? He's so good looking. And this is funny. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if you can get mad at me saying this, but I said, I bet you have, okay, I'm going to go to my analytics right now. And I like, I'm good. Now I know that YouTube is a kind of a guy's medium, right? Uh, like the viewership on YouTube is more men than women. Right. Uh, but if I look at my audience, okay. My male to female ratio is uh, 12 to 88. So 12% female, which, you know, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, yeah. Well, it's because I'm an old fart, you know. <laughs> I'm an old guy. I said, you must have like 50% women. He goes, and he looked at his assistant and like, he goes, I don't know. And I, he goes, I think it's like 1%. I said, there's no way you're at 1% female. Like, I think my wife likes it when I watch his videos on the TV. And he's just a good looking kid. You know, he's like, dude, you could totally be a movie star here in LA. <laughs> Play Take a Chance. Take a Chance. Take a Chance. Which one is that? Take a Chance. Play, take, take a Chance. Is that? Let me see. Uh, take a Chance. I don't. That didn't get released, did it? That's not one of the, my release tracks. You take a chance on me. No, that's not. I don't know. This oh, well, is that's, a, funny. That's, that's an ad. Sorry. I don't think I'll get the copyright strike for an ad playing on Google. Um, take a chance. Well, this is his. No, no. T oh, no, that's not. No, that's definitely not. That's his channel. Okay. I don't know. Um, hold on. Maybe I have it on my phone. Where is it? Here we go. What are you doing? Cancel. Okay, so. Um, hold on a second, I gotta mute. Alright, so, alright, hold on. Yeah, I've always liked that song. That song almost made it onto Changes. It was on the list, if you watch the documentary. Uh, take a chance. I don't know. Um, I think I capoed. 
It's been a long time since I, I mean, I wrote that. Um, I remember writing it. I remember being asked to write it. He wanted a sad song. He FaceTimed me and asked me for a sad song. Yeah, capo three, basically E minor, or not E minor, G minor, F over A, um, B flat to, to E flat. And then, I, you know, one of the things that I, I try to try, I live by when creating music, I don't care if it's death metal or acoustic pop, all music should be beautiful in some way, shape, or form. And so with that song, I was just trying to, um, uh, I was just trying to, if you'll notice on that song, my the top note, again, when I'm writing guitar parts like this for someone to sing over, um, I'm always trying to kind of create a melody, but I, I chose odd notes. So if you listen to this, uh, that's the seventh on top. That's the sixth. That's the fourth. So I'm avoiding all the triad tones, right? I'm not, there's no one, three, or five in here. I'm playing. And that's the seventh on top. And then I go. I think I go up to the ninth there. And then the sharp 11, which is the one that makes everybody cry. If you want to make people cry, just play the sharp 11. <laughs> See, I can't act. Maybe Paul Davids can't act, so maybe he shouldn't move to Hollywood. But he's he's damn good looking. I'm I, I'm straight enough to say that. Um. Yeah, well, the whole Beeble, that whole record, I played on. I wrote like five songs on that record, and all, the only thing that came out of that one was the Home to Mama. I mean, yeah, Home to Mama. Yeah, and I think I played on. That was how. That's how. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Andrew Watt got his start. Was like he tour was touring with Cody, but then he got in good with Justin. Like he made bet, he became best buddies with Justin. So then, and then that launched him into all sorts of stuff. I'm too old to be best buddies with Justin or any of those. You know, it's like I, the, Justin, I we love love each other. You know, when I see him, first thing he wants to do is hug and ki and not kiss, hug and and pray, <laughs> not hug and kiss. Now, Hollywood, uh, my experience in Hollywood has not been anything like that. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I tend to. Yeah, so it was th that day that I wrote that, he literally FaceTimed me and said, Hey, Tom, write me a sad acoustic song. I went, Okay, I'm on it. So, yeah. Um, it's working. Uh, yeah, I, I can't play the track. Um, I think that one is just, and that was my rig. That one's old because that was my old, the rig I use at church, but I don't even have it here at the house. I got a tune, hold on. That's just A minor, G, and, and F, but I think it's F6. And then they chopped it up. I actually did something weird with it, and they didn't like the weird, but they liked the sound. So that was, speaking of sound, that was Sounds, I think, was the producer on that. I don't know whatever happened to Sounds. I don't from him at all it's hard sometimes to work for a lot of producers because you don't you can't really trust that they're going to give you credit when they chop it up you know what i mean it's difficult so i almost rather not work than have something that i've done stolen and i'm not saying that sounds stolen anything. i'm just saying that it's i work with people that i've worked with and trust and i know they're not going to rip me off um but that's you know but um Yeah, it was that. Basically, that's all it is. But at one point, the guitar goes away, and the keyboards take over. Same chords, and then the guitar comes back. But yeah, it's just A minor 7 to G6. And again, is probably, I think, the guitar I used for that. I think it was my... I think it was my main Strat, my live Strat. 
probably. Or it could have been my 335, but yeah. Yeah, it, it never it never got released. I mean, I have a version of it, but I don't think it's the final. Um, I wish it got released. I don't know how much I would have made on I mean, I, I, they, I would have had a percentage on it, but they used, you know, my part was such a small part, but, but, but my part's always the first part. And Justin is very uh, generous with me. Um, he always gives me good percentages and Josh, they always take care of me. They like me and I like them, they're family. Um, and we, you know, um, uh, you know, it's the thing is in, in this business, um, and I'm, I'm now I'm on two and a half, three and a half hours now. The thing about the, the business is like, look, you could be the best guitar player in LA, but if you're a bummer to be around, if you're not a positive person, um, I oftentimes, you know, you'll have people in Hollywood, you know, they'll, they'll, I'll be working with them or whatever. And they go, man, you have great energy. You know, now I like to say, I like to think that that's the Jesus shining through, right? I'm trying to be, you know, a, a good person. Okay. Um, and so, uh, I think that, but, but a lot of times I hear that a lot, you know, you've got great energy, you've got great you know, karma, or you're, you're fun to have around, or whatever. Uh, but a lot of, um, uh, you know, there. if a guy shows up at a session, or a gal shows up at a session, and they complain the whole time, and they are, like, negative, or they you can't, you can't please them, or whatever, they're not going to get called again. I mean, it's just not, I, I always, I talked to, I did an interview with uh, uh, my friend Joe DeBlossi, who's played on a million things, movies and stuff like that, and Tommy Tedesco, the top LA session guitar player from the you know 50s to the 80s, um, he always had a joke at the ready. He always had a joke at the ready, and uh, <clears throat> that's um, you know because you just want to be a guy that you know fun hang. Now string players are different, you know, than music than guitar players, drummers, and bass players. You know, the band guys can be a little bit more. Great. String players are a little bit more all business. Horn players, you know the. Orchestra people, they don't they don't goof around much because there's too many of them. So you can't goof around when there's 80 of you. So they're all business. That's a different person. That's a different thing. You still can't be a downer. Um, but yeah, it's definitely tough to be, uh, you know, to be successful in this town if you are a person that nobody wants to hang out with. Because when you're in the studio, you could be cooped up in a little room with no windows for hours and hours all day long all night long it could be you could be in there for a long time and it's not going to happen so that that's some good advice you remember blowing in the wind yes another one oh thank you um yeah i i think the only version of it i have is like was it from his instagram post i don't have a copy of that i don't think was this hmm. was it that one Drummers, um, what makes the, what makes a great drummer? Same thing. I mean, Greg Bissonette, I love that guy. He is the nicest, nicest guy to hang out with. Jr. Super cool guy. Uh, John Robbins, uh, Vinny Caliuta, used to be uh, what he was struggled and he 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 had a major life changing. Um, but uh, so his he's totally a different person now than he was back in the day. So uh, he totally changed, uh, and he he found Christ and he got he got saved and he totally changed his. It's I think it saved his life. Um, but Vinny's a great guy. Um, I I don't think I've ever worked with Vinny. I've met him. I don't think he would remember meeting me. Um, uh, but my my friend Walter Rodriguez, phenomenal drummer, uh, major major you know movie scores, all all of Michael G Giacchino soundtracks he plays percussion and drums on. Or percussion mostly on so yeah there's some phenomenal um uh yeah i and and so the drummers yeah i mean you know drummers that you got to have solid time you got to have that pocket that they want to you know it's a certain feel like i said there's that here's the beat you can play a little i see i gotta see it from your perspective a little ahead of the beat a little behind the beat a little on top of the beat whatever i play with a drummer where his 
kick was ahead of the beat and his snare was behind the beat. And I'm like, how do I play with him? And a friend of mine that played with him all the time said, listen to his hi-hat. His hi-hat is dead on. And, I, and so the next time I played with him, I listened to his hi-hat. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to lock to his hi-hat because the kick and snare of this kind of, Ka-ding, ka-ding, ka-ding. you know, if you were to play kick on four on the floor and then snare on two and four, it would be this like, it's really, it's really super subtle. Um, now, I, I don't see that drummer anywhere any, anymore. I don't know that that was, is why. I don't know, you know. The other thing is if you're not showing up on time, uh, this drummer actually walked away. That drummer I'm telling you about, he, I won't say his name, he actually walked away from a gig I was doing with him because he didn't like the way the bass player was playing. That guy's not going to get any work. It's not going to happen. You can't have an attitude. You got to make it work. Yeah, they used to, yeah, well, they, 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 they made, what well, they said, they uh, created metronomes using Ringo as a, Ringo. Ringo is a freaking amazing drummer. Um, and, and Matt is touring with Ringo. I mean, Greg is touring, Greg Bissonnette as Ringo's drummer. And it's a dream come true for him. He's been doing it for years now, but, uh, uh, it's, he grew up, I mean, Ringo is why he plays, you know, Beatles are why I play guitar. Anyone who's my age or a little bit older, it's the Beatles. And that's the reason. I was born in 61. So I, you know, I remember when the Beatles were together. I remember their cartoon show. I remember, you know, um, so they, um, um, uh, but yeah, but Ringo, there was somebody who did a study of all the tracks of the Beatles. Like there's hundreds of takes, all the takes. There's something like 157 takes of uh, Hey Jude or something. It was like crazy. And in all of those takes of all of those songs through all of the years, he listened to all of them. They literally less than a dozen times they stopped because Ringo made a mistake. Like he was the consummate professional. And when you watch him in the documentary, he's just sitting there being patient and patient, I mean, gosh, that would drive me crazy. Oh, yeah. Drinking from the fire hose here. <laughs> Everybody uh, get a, make sure you have a frost, a libation of some kind, because uh, I do, yeah, we, oh, hey, love from Poland. I want to go to Poland. Poland's on my short list. I wish I could afford just to spend a year in Europe, like just live in Europe. I don't think I could do it. I would, I would lose too much work here. That, it's a bummer because I just love the vibe of Europe. Uh, but right about the time I'm over jet lag, it's time to turn home, around and go home. <laughs> so, all right, all right. So I should probably. Uh, sorry, this is a long video. It's three and a half hours. I should probably go. I, I'm going to go. I keep saying that. I'm like a bad dad. Come on, it's time to go. I'm, I mean it this time. Um, but uh, I will be here. I'll try to tune in Sunday if I remember. I know Monday I'm not going to be here, so I won't be able to do Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so next week's kind of out. But but uh, we'll we'll I'll try to touch base because I, I want to cap you know continue to capitalize on this steam. Um, and maybe I'll go. You know what? Maybe I'll go live on Friday this week or something like that. So I can't because I can't next week. Um, anyway, um, yeah, a lot of studios in Europe. I'd have to have my own studio though. I'd have to work my own. I, you know, I'll get there. It'll happen. Maybe, maybe I'll come out and do something with Paul. Um, but yeah, it was real fun. And hopefully we'll do another video together. If this one's really popular, uh, we may do something together. Cause I think it was, it was, he's just, a, he was really good interview of uh, interviewer. He asked all the right questions and he has really good guitar knowledge. So it's, yeah, it's, it was really fun. I loved handing him that, that, uh, six Eastern guitar and watch you to look on his face. They capture it's in the video. It's hilarious when he wait, is this all six E? <laughs> so I love it. Scotland. I just got back from Scotland. I was in Edinburgh with my wife for like a little over 10 days. We had a phenomenal time. Love it. Loved it. Love the pub culture. I miss it so much already, but I have to work. And I have to go to work now, guys. Come on, leave me alone. All right. So what this is a oh, almost three hour video you can watch also we've talked for a long time you just won't be able to comment live and i apologize for that but catch me just keep the turn on the notification bell i don't i don't post very often i i need to post more but i don't post very often so you won't be bothered by the bell uh, but you'll get a notification when i go live which may be something that you want to be here for that okay god bless you everybody thank you so much love uh, from los angeles and we will uh hopefully gather again soon maybe friday maybe this week okay bye-bye